Welcome to the Ultimate Crusader Kings 3 Achievement Guide. This is a video giving you a step-by-step -step guide to every achievement in the game as a sequel and update to my previous guide. This includes updated guides for the base game and Northern Lords achievements, as well as the most recent Royal Court and Fate of Iberia achievements. This guide is being made using all DLCs for the game and is accurate for patch 1.6.1.2, which was released on June 29th, 2022. As with the previous guide, this video will be approaching the game from a speedrunning perspective. There will be exploits and mechanical abuses that make some achievements trivial. That being said, CK3 actually doesn't have that many powerful exploits that ruin the game, so most achievements are pretty vanilla. The new Royal Court and Fate of Iberia mechanics that came out since the last guide have radically altered a lot of the old strategies, so I'll be going over every achievement again. Most achievements have actually gotten easier, although there are a few in particular that have gotten significantly harder since the updates. Using the strategies in this video, I obtained all 97 CK3 achievements in 29 hours. I did this in one sitting on a Twitch stream to flex my pro gamer skills, but you of course are not required to do that. With that out of the way, how about we jump into the guide? First up on our chopping block is The Things Love Does For Us. This achievement requires you to have a lover save from a murder attempt. It's pure RNG, so best of luck. For this achievement, we'll be creating a custom character for the Byzantine Empire. We're doing this because we want to have a particular set of perks and also a particular set of traits. Although when I say particular, it's not all that particular. You're going to make a character about 50 years old so you can get a bunch of perk points. You're going to make sure your education is any intrigue, and then pick a few sinful traits so they're relatively disliked. Give yourself one sun and lower your intrigue score so it's easier to get killed. Simple as that, then we just jump in. Once the character's made and we're actually in the game, our first step is to be picking our perks. Just go ahead and grab the entire middle tree, particularly grabbing Mortal Adoration. Then we're going to go into your court and just find any woman to seduce. And then you just wait. We're going to find true love using our seduction focus. As you're going, you don't really have to worry too much about actually succeeding in the events because you have so many good modifiers from your old age and perks that you'll get her no matter what you do. Don't forget to, when you actually get the lover event, to take the one that makes you fall in love. Don't just sleep with her once. Stick around. There's no way to actually plot your own assassination, sadly, except for one little workaround that we can do. Once you got your lover, go ahead and try to imprison a vassal and fail intentionally. You'll be deposed and now you're playing as your son while your father is still alive. Begin a murder plot against your previous character as your son, invite all the agents that you can to increase the chance of the murder plot going through, and then repeat again so that you can end up playing as your father once more. This will create a plot to get you killed, and then since you're playing as the guy that's got the plot against him, you'll be able to hopefully get yourself assassinated. At this point, it's just RNG. If you're lucky, your lover saves you. As you can see here, it'll save murder preventer in the event. If not, then you have to retry over and over again. And that's why it's pure RNG. Good luck. Let's go take a look at the next achievement. This next run comprises two achievements, and we're playing as Haston of Montague. The first achievement is Faster Than the Fox, which requires us to, as a North Germanic Asatri character, completely control the Kingdom of Sicily before 1047. And the other one is Going Places, which requires us to, as Haston of Montague, hold any Kingdom title. This run has a little bit of RNG, but much less than the previous run, and it's actually quite a lot of fun if you ask me. It's one of the most fun achievements in this run. Now, despite what Faster Than The Fox says, we actually can have a custom character, we just can't play as one. So we're going to go make a custom character for the Byzantine Empire because we're going to have to fight them later. And what we're going to focus on with this character is getting at least 8 Marshal, and that's because any character with 8 Marshal will almost always choose to lead armies. And we're going to be giving him traits that will make him more likely to be captured in battle. So Brave increases that chance, One-Legged does, and Disfigured. Once you do that, drop all of his stats to 0 except for Marshal, again make sure that's at 8. Make him young or whatever you want, doesn't really matter, and then we'll drop in as Haston. Your first move as Haston is to immediately go into your perks and check if you have the left hand side tree of the perks. If you do, you're good. If not, reset your perks because we need the sapper trait. Once you've got your perks selected, go ahead and declare war on the county of Napoli with the Varangi Adventure CB. We're doing a Varangi Adventure because Varangi Adventures give you a crap ton of money when you win, and it'll also place us right in the heart of Sicily, so we'll have access to everyone there and we can win all a bunch of wars. For your next two wars, you're going to declare war on Salerno with a county conquest, and then you're going to declare war on the Sodanids for Bari specifically. This is because the Italians are currently trying to take Bari, and if they take it, we'll have to fight the Italians for it, which is a lot more work than just fighting Sodanids for it. As you're fighting these wars, by the way, I'd highly recommend grabbing about 200 Varangian veterans. 
just because they're really good and they're gonna help us beat the Byzantines very easily. But don't raise them in these wars, let them reinforce, because we don't actually want to use them against the Sodanids because they're too weak to matter. But let's let them reinforce so they'll be ready when we fight the Italians and the Byzantines, who are actually tough. Once you take Bari, there's actually a very interesting mechanical interaction that I still don't really understand. For whatever reason, the war that Italy had with the Sodanids for Bari transfers to Benevento for the county of Apulia. I don't know why this happens, but either way it kind of works out for us because then we can declare war on Benevento for the county of Apulia, once again robbing the Italians of a county they would have otherwise wanted. Similar to what happened with the Sodanids and the Beneventoans, once you take Apulia, Italy's not going to come for you, but luckily this war is very easy since the Italians have already been weakened from fighting the other people and you are quite strong. All we're going to go for here is a white piece because we want to be at peace and declare more wars for other stuff. So don't try to win, just go for 30%, get a white piece, resume your conquests. Speaking of conquests, we're going to be going for the Aglibids next because they're the next sort of weakest target we have. They rule Sicily, which is a duchy we have to get, so we'll just declare a duchy war and grab all of Sicily. If we're lucky, we'll capture the king of the Aglibids in a battle. If we're unlucky, we have to siege down Sicily, we have to fight him a few times, and we'll win by taking a war score eventually. This war tends to be a little bit slower than the other ones. You can't do much about it, so just live with it, I guess. A quick tip here as well, by the way, we're going to need a lot of money to make duchies and kingdom titles. So go ahead and make sure to be ransoming everyone that you can be at all times, because that way we can get a lot of money. One of the actual roadblocks for this run, funnily enough, is having the money left over to create two duchy titles, because we need two, and to create a kingdom. That costs a thousand gold in total, so ransoming is kind of important. Next we're going to declare war on Italy for the county of Capua. They're going to be kind of dumb, and they're going to send their troops on boats down to South Italy. Remember that anytime an army disembarks, they take a minus 30 to their advantage. So go ahead and wait for them to land, and then immediately fight them the second that they do, and you'll probably absolutely slaughter them. If you're lucky, you capture the king. If not, you siege Capua, you let ticking war score go up, you siege other counties around, try to avoid the mountains, because you could actually lose a battle in the mountains, so be careful. It should be okay. Italy might ally Lotharingia. If they do, as long as you fight off Italy before Lotharingia gets there, you'll be okay. Because when they combine their armies, they stand a chance. If they're both alone, they'll never be able to defeat you. The next war is the biggest one. This is against the Byzantines. We custom created a character to make this war much easier. We should have to only win one battle, and then we'll be able to immediately win the war by capturing the Emperor. Go and siege the county of Syracuse, which is in the south in Sicily, the island. And once you do that, the Byzantines will probably land troops up in Bari as a way to kind of siege something while you're sieging something. Because we have sappers, we'll siege much faster than them. So once they land, we should have Syracuse occupied. Go up north and go fight the Byzantines. And at this point, you should just capture the Emperor, because we have so many modifiers that make it easier to capture him, that it should just happen. If not though, keep fighting the Emperor until you do, and if you never capture him, if you're just super unlucky, go and occupy Lecce, which is that little strip off of the boot on the right hand side. Go ahead and occupy that, and then you can just keep winning battles until your ticking war score gets you the win. At this point in the run, your last two targets are going to be Benevento, who you've already fought once and therefore will have a truce with, and Camarda, who is the remnants of a guy that you fought before, the Sodanids. And you're going to have truce with both of them if you were fast enough. If not, you have no truce, you can go to war right away. But just in case, we don't want to be too foolhardy. Don't break truces yet. Just wait for one of their truces to be up, and then we can go and fight them once truce is gone. In the meantime, make the Kingdom of Sicily, and if you're low on money, go do some raiding just as a way to acquire some cash. Once one of the truces is up, go ahead and declare the most appropriate wars. So that would either be a war for the Duchy of Benevento, or a war for the Duchy of Calabria. These wars should be extremely easy, nothing to worry about, I won't give you any notes. Once you've taken Benevento and Calabria, there should only be one county left to take, and that is the county of Camarda, which is ruled over by the guy you just fought a war with. But because we're in a speedrunning mood, we're not going to wait for the truce to go up this time, we're just going to declare a county conquest, grab the last county, and that will be the end. You should have gotten going places once you made the King of Sicily, and you'll have faster than the fox once you've conquered the last county. Let's look at the next achievement. For the next run, we're doing another combo run. This is going to be going for Holidaying in Iberia, which requires us to start as an uninvolved character, become involved in the struggle, and then end it. And we're going for Iberian Hostilities, which requires us to end the struggle through means of force. This run is basically RNG once again, but much better RNG than the previous runs. Uh, it's a little bit of a just pure chance, though. The nice thing about it is that the process by which you do the achievement is the exact same every single time for everyone. So you can basically copy everything I do in this guide and you'll get the achievement eventually once the RNG hits.
First of all, before any character creation, go into your game rules and set gender equality rules to be inverted. You'll see why very soon. We're going to be starting off as the Sultan of Al-Andalus, although we're making custom character. There are a few things that are very important in the character creation, and then some things that are not as important. First of all, the character must be Mozarabic, so go into your Faith tab, change to Christianity Mozarabism. Your culture must not be Iberian, or any of the involved cultures like Baranis and Mashriki. Go ahead and change to anything you want. Set your age to about 40 years so we can get some perks. Set your education to learning because we're going to need the apostate perk later. Give yourself a couple of holy traits in the Mozarabism faith so that we can start the game with a little bit of piety and so that we're well liked. And then from there, that's everything that you need. You don't need anything else. Beyond that, you're good. But I like to set my stewardship really high because we're going to have some extra domain. So if your stewardship's high enough, you don't have to give out as much of it. So that way it just saves us some time. That's all. From there, go ahead and start the game. What you're going to immediately notice once you get in is that suddenly you have 38 domain, and this is because we inverted the gender roles. In Islam, at least in the game, only men can hold land, so if a woman ever obtains land, she immediately loses it. If we invert the gender roles, then the opposite is true. All of the Muslim rulers who were men are now going to immediately lose their titles, and they'll be passed on to us or their heirs, whoever their heirs are. So we have 38 domain. Our first objective is to give it all away in a reasonable way. We want to create some dukes that are of the Mozarabic faith because one of the requirements to convene the Council of Toledo is to have powerful vassals that are Mozarabic. So go ahead and give out titles according to the duchies that you have, with the explicit exception of the Duchy of Badajoz. You must keep that duchy under all circumstances. Once you've given out every duchy that you have except for Badajoz, go ahead and just give out individual counties to individual rulers. It doesn't really matter as long as they're Mozarabic. And you're also going to grant independence to the duchy of Algarve, which is in the southwest of your kingdom. This is because they already are a powerful vassal and we need them to not be in our realm so we can host the Council of Toledo. Once you've given out your titles, move your capital to the county of Toledo. We're doing this so that we can make the Kingdom of Toledo. Go ahead and convert to local culture so you become Andalusian. You should then have access to create the Kingdom of Toledo. Go ahead and click that. You're also going to click the button to convene the Council of Toledo. And then you're going to go on a pilgrimage. It doesn't really matter how far your pilgrimage is, we only need a little bit of piety, so go ahead and choose just Santiago. That'll be fine. Next, go into your focuses, go ahead and select Scholarship, and then take everything in the middle tree that you can, focusing in on Apostate. That's the only one that you actually need. Next, move your capital back to Cordoba where it was before. We're doing this because we want our capital to be in the Kingdom of Al Andalus. Now that you've done all of that, we can finally unpause the game and we're going to see what happens. This is where RNG comes in. When the Council of Toledo event comes up, go ahead and click through it until you get to the event where you can choose to either support the council or shout it down. When you shout down a council, there's a 20% chance that the phase will change to hostility. If it does, you can continue. If it doesn't, you have to restart and do all of this again. If you got hostility, then great. Go ahead and convert to Mu'ullah the Islam, and then you should be able to end the struggle right then and there. A quick explanation of this is that when we created the Kingdom of Toledo, we shrunk the Kingdom of Al-Andalus down to only its Mu'ladi and only its Andalusian counties. This is important because to end the struggle hostilely, we have to have our capital kingdom have only our culture and our religion inside of it. So now that we did that, we can end the struggle immediately once we hit the hostility phase because we have no counties to convert to any culture or to any faith. As usual, spend a couple days to make sure the achievement pops, and then we can move on to the next achievement. For this next run, we've got Brave and Bold, which requires us to start as the PS in A67 and rule Poland, as in the kingdom, and own a famed or illustrious rarity regalia, crown, weapon, and armor. This run is RNG again, and the reason why we have a lot of RNG achievements so far is because we start off with the RNG ones in the beginning, get them out of the way, then go on to smooth sailing. Also, for this run, I'm going to include an estimate, which is about an hour to an hour and a half, because these longer runs kind of could use one in case you want to know what you're getting into. Also, just a quick note that the footage for this achievement is taken from my stream, simply for convenience sake. I don't want to have to sit through another one of these runs if I don't have to. Let's get into it. So this run's kind of interesting in that there's not really a whole lot of guidance I can give you besides run a normal Polania game. You're going to go ahead and drop in as Polania. And Siemovit is a pretty good character. He's got a lot of good martial points, but he's not going to be one we finish the run with. What you're going to do is just use County Conquest on your neighbors to sort of solidify your realm and get stronger. Get married to someone either for good skills or for good alliance, whatever you need honestly. And then just create Poland naturally. 
no weirdness about this, no strange exploits, you're just going to create Poland. One thing you're going to be trying to do, there's two things I guess you can be trying to do, and that is that have children who will be good at diplomacy. So essentially what you're hoping for is one son at some point who gets a diplomacy focused education and who can sort of be the one that you end up completing the achievement as. The second thing you're going to be doing is keeping an eye on all of the kings around you looking for artifacts that are illustrious or famed, that's blue or purple for the colors. We're not going to be making our own artifacts this run because that would be way too RNG dependent and way too long. We're going to be stealing. Remember that one of the diplomacy perks is Accomplished Forger, which allows you to spend prestige to get a claim on an artifact. That's why we need our first kid to end up being a diplomacy kid so we can get those perks real fast. For now though, we can't steal, so if you see any in another kingdom, just write it down somewhere or take a mental note so you can come back to it later when you can steal artifacts. Once you've got enough of Poland to create the actual kingdom, go ahead and raid if you need extra money, and then create the kingdom. That's sort of like step one done of this run. We've got the kingdom of Poland, our next step now is going to be becoming feudal, which is a bit more of a interesting process. Unless your run is vastly different than mine, there's going to be a bunch of South Slavic guys that are really weak in small little independent counties that are within the de jure empire borders of the Byzantine Empire. If you hold land in the de jure borders of the Byzantines, you can swear fealty to them much more easily because you'll be a rightful liege kind of thing. So go ahead and conquer. I did Travunia in this run. It's a little tiny county there. You can conquer any of those guys, though I recommend one of the smaller guys just because it's faster. And then we're going to be swearing fealty to the Byzantines. You'll see why in a second. In my run, before swearing fealty to the Byzantines, I chose to conquer the rest of Poland, mostly for, honestly, aesthetic reasons. If you're trying to be a true speedrunner, you probably should not do that because it just costs more time. But, you know, when I'm doing a long run, I kind of want the map to look nice, so I did that. Also because it means I'm stronger, so I can defend myself from civil wars or from uprisings or whatever I need to do. It's sort of like a safety mechanism. On a run that's an hour to an hour and a half, and this is a general rule in speedrunning, you want to take safe routes, because if you have to restart 45 minutes in, that's way worse than spending 10 minutes making the safe route. Either way, whenever you're ready, swear fealty to the Byzantines, and then you're going to try to convert to Orthodox Christianity. We're doing this because one way that you can become feudal is actually to do adopt feudal ways through liege. It requires you to have at least level 2 tribal authority, be an organized religion, and have a feudal liege. It's much easier than having to get to max level tribal authority and having to reform the faith first. So we're doing that. I recommend at this point changing your feudal contract with the Byzantine Emperor to give yourself council rights because we're going to use the stewardship council to make a crap ton of money and build up our domain while we're kind of just waiting for our kids to grow up. At this point in the run, you have two objectives. One is to have a good domain, the other one is to locate artifacts that you can steal. This is the part where it's RNG unfortunately. If the AI just hasn't been making artifacts, you really can't do much about it and you have to kind of just hope you find some. Sometimes what you can do is you can find them in far off places like in India and you can kind of fabricate claim your way over to India to get the diplomatic range to attack them. But you know, it's it's kind of just luck. If you're lucky, people in Western Europe will have it and you're good to go. If you're unlucky, well, best of luck I guess. Once you're playing as your next character, who hopefully is a very diplomatic character, you're going to want to stop being the steward and go become the chancellor on the Byzantine Empire's court. This is because you get more prestige, you get more diplomacy experience and everything. You're going to pick a focus for diplomacy and start working on the left hand side of the tree. In my case, I chose to take the first couple perks from the middle tree, if only because you could get a lot of prestige that way. But we need to get to accomplished forger on the left side. If during your run you find that you cannot find any artifacts to steal, then you can start making your own artifacts if you think it'll work out. I usually only do this if I have one left because as a speedrunner it's a big waste of time to sit around hoping for artifacts to work. But in this case, for my stream run here, I chose to make an artifact and it didn't end up working out. You can try it too, but I'd honestly recommend that if within the first say half an hour of your attempt, you have not found any artifacts to steal, you may just want to restart because in this case, you're just not going to find any. Beyond that, I mean, this achievement is pretty much over at this point. Once you got the artifacts, you're all good to go. You already are Poland, you already are feudal, you're all good. It should be relatively easy. The only thing is the RNG on the artifacts. If you're a casual player, then go ahead and just turn this into a full campaign and just start making artifacts and you'll get them over time. Nothing to worry about, you'll be completely fine. But if you're speedrunning, your reset point is probably gonna be if you don't find any artifacts by about the 25 minute to half hour mark. Best of luck, let's go on to the next achievement. Okay, 
next is Dalrama. Up next is our first sort of large run, which is going to be very long. We're going to be going for two achievements, both of them in Africa. One of them is Mother of Us All, which requires us to start as Magajia Daura and reform an African pagan faith and convert all of Africa to it. The second is Nobody Comes to Fika, which requires us to, with the county of Fika as our primary title, diverge our culture and spread to 30 counties. This run is killer for your mental state. It's, abs it's, it's long, it's a little bit difficult, it has actually less RNG than you think, and thankfully, the new culture mechanics, that is by the sword, has made this achievement actually significantly easier and faster than it was before Royal Court. So that's great. The estimate now is about four to five and a half hours, depending on your computer speed, depending on how you know, much attention you pay to the game, that kind of thing. Let's get right into it. Before we get into the game at all, go into your rule set and we're going to turn off diverging culture except for for the player. This is because when you're spreading the Fika culture around, your vassals might choose to hybridize or diverge the culture themselves. We just want to nip that in the bud and not have it happen. So go in and turn off the diverge culture and hybridize culture for the AI. A couple housekeeping notes, two to be specific. First off, your focus should be theology and you should aim for the profit perk. Second off, when you get the succession event, pick the bottom option that gives you female preference. With that out of the way, our first steps are to conquer the county of Fika, which thankfully is right beside us. You're going to go declare a county conquest on Katagum, and then use that connection to get to Fika. Also, you should try romancing some people because we're going to need some prestige so that we can diverge our culture. So find someone you can romance, uh, there's all kinds of characters around. The higher rank they are, the more prestige you get, so best of luck with that. It's unfortunately a bit of RNG, it's probably the only piece of real RNG in this run. Once we've conquered Fika, remember we have to set it as our primary title, so to do that, click on the little shield, when you click on the county, there's like a little icon for the county. Click on it, and then go to make primary. This makes it your primary title, you do not have to move your capital there, you just gotta have it as your primary title, and then focus on romancing or doing whatever you have to do to get prestige. Please, do not create any duchies before you diverge your culture, because otherwise you cannot get the achievement. You have to diverge the culture while Fika is your primary title. Once you do diverge the culture, what you're going to do is pick the spiritual ethos. This is because we're going to want to get by the sword as a tradition, and that gets a discount if you're spiritual. Also because it makes faith reformation cheaper and we want to reform our faith, so it kind of works out perfectly to be spiritual. Now that you've diverged, we can start actually conquering stuff. Your first step is going to be trying to get a duchy title so that you can have county vassals. And your targets, in terms of conquests, are going to be two holy sites. There's one to the south in Igbo land, there's another one to the north in Kanem. You're going to be going for both, and once you get both, we're going to focus on reforming. I've skipped forward a bit in the run here, just because uh, it's not really too many notes to give. You're going to sort of conquer in all directions that you can. One thing I will say is that rather than making a kingdom yourself, try to wait and see if someone else makes one and then subjugate them. This way you can avoid the gold cost. The best option is Canem because they're already your religion, but Yoruba land can be okay. Problem with Yoruba land is that they are the wrong religion, so that can be a bit tough for your stability. Regardless though, you should definitely save the subjugation for a kingdom. Once you've got the piety for it, we're going to reform the faith. Here's the following tenets and doctrines I recommend. You want to go warmonger, adoricism, and mendicant preachers. You want to be fundamentalist, lay clergy, temporal, head of faith. And then the only other thing I recommend changing is get allowed kinslaying, because this makes it way easier to do succession. Uh, disinheriting can be expensive, but imprisoning plus executing is always free. And we can avoid the kinslayer negative if we have the allowed kinslaying. Before getting the by the sword cultural tradition, I actually recommend using your one holy war for kingdom as Daurama on Yoruba land because that's a lot of free land to get and also they're a very tough enemy. They have a unit called the Bush Hunters and those units are really really good. You can counter them with your Sahel horsemen but they get bonuses in jungles and forests and all the territory in Yoruba land is jungle and forests. Therefore I recommend using it here and if your husband is still alive call him in to get this war done because once this war is done you won't really have any competition in the area. From here, we have two focuses. One is to get by the sword, which is the cultural tradition that lets you do infinite kingdom holy wars. The second is to allow your heir to be a military character so that you can get the Bellum Justum perk and use that for half off CBs to make holy warring even cheaper. You're also going to want to get the generational belligerence dynasty legacy so you can get even cheaper CBs and then declare holy wars with kingdoms for very cheap. That way you can just steamroll through the whole thing. I recommend heading eastwards so you can get the Empire of Khan and Bornu and try to get to Egypt. I brought up Egypt before because Egypt's going to be the first conquest you do that's going to result in some instability in your realm. You can give all the land to Boris and Fikas and that'll be fine, 
But remember that the populists are still going to be upset. You're going to have a lot of Egyptian Ashari populists who are going to be really, really not okay with you ruling them. When you conquer this, those populist groups can rise up in about a year. But don't be afraid. It's going to look like a lot. It's going to say like 300% of your military strength is here. But actually, it's all a lie. Because by sheer numbers, yes. But the populists rise up separated and with no men-at-arms. If you have good men-at-arms, like the Sahel Horsemen and like the Archers, the Bowmen, whatever they're called, then you're going to be completely fine killing all of them. Because those men-at-arms outclass levies so powerfully that you could fight a group of populists that's like two times the size of your army and you should still win. Managing your vassals also is a bit of a task, but it's easier than you think, especially if you have the extreme stability realm rule on. One thing I'll say is that I like to have king vassals during this run because managing dukes can be a lot of work. Having a couple of kings they're allied to is great, but I recommend doing it once you already have maxed out men-at-arms and an unkillable economy and maxed out domain because when you have small vassals, you get more money and more levies. When you have big vassals, you get more stability but less of those things. So I recommend waiting a bit before the king vassals. Another note I'm going to say about wise expansion is if you see that a populist rebellion is coming in the east of your country, do not declare a war on the west end side. I've done this before in several runs, not this one, I didn't do it too much here. But sometimes you declare a war for let's say the kingdom of Africa, and then a rebellion comes up in Abyssinia. That's a big pain in the ass and will cost you a lot of time, because you either have to walk across Africa, which you know, good luck with that, or you have to disband your troops and wait 12 months or however long your penalty is for them to be raisable again. Pay attention to your populist factions, you know, that kind of thing. And war in the area that the factions are. Or wait until the factions are gone. Up to you. I'd also recommend that you rush North Africa because there's a lot of Muslims there that are Zaidi or Ismaili or various sects of Islam that have Taqiyya. So converting them can be a bit slower, so you're better off getting it done early. Whereas the pagans in West Africa, except for the adaptive ones like the Seguics, are relatively easy to convert. So prioritize getting Africa. It's also because you don't want people like the Italians or like the Andalusians to conquer into North Africa because that's a way harder war to fight rather than just fighting some of the Berbers. Alright, so this section's one that you might not necessarily even need to hear if you know how to take care of yourself. But let me tell you this, this run is long, this run is difficult, this run requires focus. So, you know, it's probably a good idea to pace yourself a little bit. Even if you're not going the optimal speed, sometimes taking some time to sit Pass time or take a break, whatever you gotta do, can actually help you be a little bit faster. Because you can get so wrapped up in details that you make mistakes like allowing a rebellion to rise up in the west when you're already in the east, or allowing vassals to create massive civil wars that take forever to end. So taking the time to keep yourself sane is actually very important. That's gonna be my last note about this run for you, is keep yourself sane. And also, don't forget to be culture converting. Sometimes I would have super long runs and I would forget to be culture converting with my steward and then I would get stuck not being able to get nobody comes to Fika. So remember, continue converting always. At all times, a county should be on the way to becoming Fika. And if you time it right, you should end up getting 30 Fika counties right by the time you conquer Africa and right by the time you convert it. With that though, that's pretty much it for this run. I wish you the best of luck. It's a long run, but I'm sure you all can do it. Let's look at the next run. Hey, there it is. Mother of us all. 53 minutes ahead. Fuck. Okay. The next run is Franco Croatia, which requires you to, as a French Catholic, hold and completely control the Kingdom of Thessalonica without holding or being vassalized to the Byzantine Empire. You don't have to actually have the kingdom title, you only have to have all the land in the de jure kingdom area. This run is really quick, really easy, and we'll just jump right into it. For this run, we're gonna actually be making a custom character, but not playing as one. We're going to make a custom character for the Byzantine Empire, and we're going to do something similar to what we did in a previous run, where we're going to give him 8 martial and then give him brave and 1 legged, so that he can have a very high chance of being captured in battle. The achievement is still doable even if you don't capture him, but it's just a little cautionary measure to see if we can go fast, that's all. Once the character's done, we're going to drop in as Haston. As usual for perk selection, if you already have the left hand side of the tree, you're good. If not, reset perks and take everything in the left hand side and take a few in the right hand side. Don't forget to also reassign your learning perks that you will have lost as well when you reset. The only major thing we have to do in this run is get enough prestige to be able to declare a kingdom invasion war. There's a couple ways to do that, but I'm going to show you an exploit to do that, and that is to continuously remarry the same person over and over again. We're going to basically divorce our wife, and we're going to go over to Saga Truthspeaker, who is the daughter of Halfton, 
but we're gonna get married to her just once. You might have to send money to Halfton to get him to allow you to marry her. From there, we're going to now declare a county conquest war on Napoli, because we need to get close up diplomatic range to actually attack the Byzantines. So go ahead and conquer them, but important note, do not ring in adventure, just do a county conquest. Once you've got the war won, go ahead and go on a pilgrimage and raise a runestone so you can get a lot of piety. We need this piety so that we can divorce Saga Truthspeaker over and over again and remarry her over and over again for prestige. Once you've got the prestige that you need, we can go ahead and declare the war on the Byzantines for Invade Kingdom of Thessalonica. By the way, you can actually use Halfton, your ally that you got through Saga Truthspeaker, to help you in this war, although you really don't need it. It can just be a nice uh, safety measure. Once you land somewhere in Thessalonica and grab an occupation, go ahead and fight the Byzantines at the nearest convenience, and let's hope for a capture. If you don't get it, then just keep sieging and you'll eventually win. It doesn't really matter if you get the capture or not, it just helps speed things up. Once you win the war, you now control all of Thessalonica, and it's simple to become French and Catholic. Just go ahead and click the Embrace Local Traditions button. If you never rang it adventured, then your capital is still going to be in Montague, which is French and Catholic, and then you're done. Easy achievement. Let's move on. For the next achievement, we've got Almost There, which requires you to, as Almost Arpad, to form Hungary and convert to Catholicism. Asterisk because it's actually any Christianity, not just Catholicism. This run takes like a minute to do, it's very quick, so let's get into it. Almost there is real quick and we're going to use similar tactics from before. Go ahead and go into the character designer for Bulgaria and create a brave one-legged disfigured character so we can get him captured very easily. Then we're going to drop in as almost Arpad. Your immediate move when you drop into the game is to pick your perks. We're going to go for the left hand side of the tree like we normally do. Then you're going to declare a war for the migration to Pannonia CB which is the one you get as almost Arpad specifically and just go ahead and win the war. It's very easy. Since we made the Bulgarian king very easy to capture, you'll probably just capture him in a battle. But if not, siege at least one place over in Hungary, then go and fight him over and over again until you get a lot of war score. And if you really don't capture him, if you're just super unlucky, go ahead and occupy as much stuff as you can, and then you'll win. Now just convert to Christianity, Idris Orthodoxy. Easy, achievement done. Let's look at the next one. For this run, we're going to be doing King of All the Isles, which requires you to start and stay as a North Germanic Asatruan of any kind, and completely control everything in the islands in the Mediterranean region without ever having over 80 realm size. This is a bit misleading because you also need all of the Baltic Islands and all of the Atlantic Islands, so it's not quite Mediterranean, but whatever. Also, this is going to be another Haston run, so I just love playing as Haston, don't you? The estimate for this run is about an hour to an hour and a half. As we always do for character creation, we're going to pick a particularly strong enemy, in this case the Byzantine Empire, like usual, and we're going to turn them into a brave, one-legged, disfigured, one-eyed character with no prowess so that we can capture them in battle more easily. As we always do with Haston, we'll be declaring war on the Byzantines pretty much for our first war, so go ahead and make the Byzantines easy to capture so we can ease our war later. Although, with how this run is going to work, we don't actually want to end the war immediately, we're going to be dragging the war on a little bit. As I've said a hundred times now, like usual, swap your military perks to the left hand side of the tree. Go ahead and add in your learning perks as well. I recommend actually taking the medicine focus instead of the strategy focus, because this run is long enough that Haston may not necessarily live for the whole run. So if you take medicine, you have a higher chance of surviving the whole run. From here, we're also going to do the classic move of divorcing our current wife and then marrying Sog for truth speaker so we can get some prestige later. And once you do that, declare a reigning adventure for Sardinia. Once we've defeated Sardinia, we're going to start getting some piety. We can do this with the runestone, we can do this by executing prisoners, we can get prisoners by raiding, and we also need money anyway so we can get some more men-at-arms so that we can get some mercenaries to fight the Byzantines. So go ahead and start raiding just a little bit. We're going to try to get some piety that we can use to divorce our wife and then remarry her for the prestige that we need to be able to fight the Byzantines in an invade kingdom war. I also recommend attacking the Beleries right away simply because sometimes West Francia will conquer a small piece of them and fighting West Francia is way more annoying than just fighting the Beleries, so get them out of the way while it's early and easy. Once you're ready to declare war on the Byzantines, go ahead and declare a war for the Kingdom of Thessalonica. This is because that kingdom itself actually has quite a few islands in it like Rhodes and Lesbos and Chios, so we're going to need to get those, and also because we're going to be taking Constantinople which we can then make our capital and turn into a nice power base for ourselves. But, as you declare this war, there's a few notes I'm going to have to give you about it. Remember that in an Invade Kingdom CB, you take everything you occupy as well as the kingdom that you declared for. So, we're going to have to occupy a few islands the Byzantines have. First is their section of Sicily, second is Malta, third is Southern Cyprus, and fourth is Cephalonia and Boothrotum. Those two might not look like islands, especially Boothrotum, 
but they actually are. They're located in the Kingdom of Epirus, and they have some little island parts of them, and the game considers them islands, so you have to occupy them and get them. You may end up capturing the Byzantine Emperor before occupying all the islands that you need, and that's okay. Don't end the war yet. Instead, just ransom the Emperor for some extra money and to bankrupt his army, and that way the war becomes even easier. We're not going to end this war until we have all of our occupations. Once you win the war, we have some housekeeping to do. First of all, go ahead and give away all the islands that you took to some Norse vassals that you can trust. Second of all, we're going to make an independent vassals out of Mosinopolis, Thessaly, and Demetrius because they're not actually islands and we don't need them. And then finally, you're going to move your capital to Constantinople and you're going to sort of set up there. Give away your land in Sardinia, hold on to Constantinople, Calliopolis, and Brysis, and you can keep Abydos if you have the space for it, but if you don't, then give it away to someone. After you do that, we're actually going to be at peace for a while and build up some control in Constantinople and convert the culture and religion if we can, just because we might as well get some stability going before we go on any more military campaigns. From here, the wars you're going to declare are going to be dependent on the vulnerability of your enemies. In my case, Italy seemed quite vulnerable because their king had passed away and there was a daughter on the throne. So I went after them and we went for Corsica, because Corsica was islands I have to take. But for you, they may not be so available. So now you're going to sort of look around for weak opponents. I recommend the Hafsids, who are a small duchy on the island of Crete. The Abbasids can be weak at this point, although they often aren't, and if they are, then go for the north part of Cyprus, if you're lucky they will be. But if not, I recommend heading west towards the Canaries. You can get access to the Canaries by declaring war on one of the small guys in northern Morocco, and then that will give you the range to attack the Canaries. And from the Canaries, you can start jumping into the British Isles, because we're going to have to head there eventually too. Again, different save files with different scenarios. In my scenario, the King of England looked pretty weak, so I went for the Isle of Wight, which is that little island just south of Wessex. But in your case, maybe they won't be. Maybe Gwynedd will be more weak for you. But regardless, I went for it and I managed to get it. And once you have Wight, you'll have access to pretty much the entire of the British Isles. And your goal next is start working on getting the Isle of Man. Because once you have the Isle of Man, we can start working elevating the Kingdom of Isles of Man and getting all those free units. We're going to actually use the woman that we married at the very beginning, Saga Truthspeaker, to get prestige to be able to create the Kingdom of Man of the Isles. Now it's going to cost a lot of piety, but if you've been raiding here and there, or if you have prisoners, and you're Norse still, you can just execute people and that will allow you to get a bunch of piety. So go ahead and do a combo of executions of prisoners in order to get piety, and then use that piety to divorce your wife and remarry her over and over again until you are a living legend, and then elevate the Kingdom of Man of the Isles. From here, the achievement is very easy. All you gotta do is stay alive. If you took the medicine focus, and if you have the whole of body perk, then you definitely will live long enough. But if you didn't, you're running a little bit risky. Head into the Baltic through Denmark, and you gotta conquer a couple things there. You gotta conquer Iceland, you gotta conquer Northern Isles, you gotta conquer the rest of Cyprus, and so on. You gotta conquer Venice, don't forget about them. Before I finish off this section, I'm just gonna show you kind of all the islands you gotta conquer in a quick section. You'll see as I sort of look at them all here. Once you take all those, you'll have the achievement, and then you're done. You're good to go. In terms of actually being safe and everything, this run is very safe once you hit this part. There's no real precautions to take, nothing to really worry about. You're pretty much safe. You might get assassinated, but if you have a good spy master who's loyal to you, you won't get assassinated. You might die early, but if you took the medicine focus and you have the medicine perks, you won't die early. Those are the reasons why we do those precautions. Best of luck on your run. My run was pretty good, and let's look at the next one. For the next achievement, we've got Kings to the 7th Generation, which is a nice and quick one. It requires you to start as Count Eudes Capet of Anjou in A67, and lead your dynasty to rule the Kingdom of France. This one is going to be a real quick one. As we so often do, we're going to be making a custom character who we won't be playing as. Go ahead and make a custom character for the Kingdom of West Francia. We're going to make a woman of a foreign culture but Catholic religion, with at least craven, content, and lazy, although you can add more traits as you see fit. I added some sins just to make her more hated, but that's not really required. We're going to drop all of her stats to nothing, and then we're going to jump in as Eudes. The strategy for this run basically involves waiting until you're an adult, going on a pilgrimage, asking the Pope for a claim to the kingdom, and then immediately creating a faction to take over the kingdom. Since we're too young to go on a pilgrimage right now, we're going to spend our time instead becoming a duke, because right now we're a count. Luckily, we are a vassal underneath our liege, who is the ruler of the Duchy of Anjou. We have a claim to that duchy. So, we're going to get an alliance by marrying, or rather betrothing at this age, to a random Irish count, calling them into the war, and using them to win the war against our uncle. 
Once you win the war against your uncle, you're now a duke. And now we just have to sit here and wait until we're 16. You literally have nothing to do until then. Once you're 16, go on a pilgrimage and take the longest route you can. I mean, you don't have to, but I like to. And once you come back and you get the piety, go ahead and request a claim on the throne through the pope. It's very easy. You should almost certainly get it. And at this point, the AI should already be forming factions. And if you're really lucky, then the Queen of France will be in some wars with some Varangians or some, you know, Vikings or whatever she's doing. If she is, she's a lot more likely to give in to your demand. So go ahead and make the faction. Wait and see who joins. Give it a little while. If you get above 100% power, immediately press the demand. If she's in debt and in a war, immediately press the demand no matter what your power is. But either way, she'll probably just let you on the throne. And if not, you can go and beat her in a war. Easy clap. Let's look at the next one. This run is called Bod Chen Po and it requires you to, as a member of the Pu Yel dynasty, recreate the Empire of Tibet. It's a short explanation, but it's actually a little bit of a complex run. The estimate is about half an hour to 45 minutes. For this run, we actually don't have any characters to create, so isn't that wonderful? We can just jump right in as the King of Gyuge. The character we're playing as actually has randomly generated traits and stats. For your focus, you're going to pick Majesty because we need a lot of prestige and we need to take getting to the True Ruler perk. And then we're going to do a couple of steps right off the bat. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to send our court chaplain to fabricate a claim on the county of Siwa. We're doing this because we want to become a different culture, so we're going to conquer that county later, move our capital there, and then convert to its culture. Second, we're going to claim the title of the Kingdom of Mariul to our northwest, and then we're going to fight our family for it. This war is made trivial by the fact that you actually have a bunch of house members who can help you in this war. You can call them in for free, so go ahead and do that to help you. Also, lastly, grab yourself a wife who has the highest possible diplomacy, and then set her role to be assisting your diplomatic points, because that way you can get the highest diplomacy possible, which we can use to vassalize people later. While our kingdom is still relatively small, it's going to be important to build up our court grandeur, so set all of your amenities to max right now. We're going to drop them later because remember that amenity price is based on the realm size of your kingdom or empire. So while we're small, it's very cheap. Once we get bigger, it only gets more expensive. After you win the war with Mariul, our next target is going to be that person we were fabricating a claim on before, which should have finished during your previous war. So go ahead and declare a county conquest for the county of Siwa. Again, call in your family members to help you to make this war very trivial. And once you win, we'll go to the next steps of this run. Now that you've got Siwa, move your capital there just temporarily and go into decisions and hit convert to local culture. You'll now be Sumpa culture, which is egalitarian. So you can use that to change your court type to diplomatic, which we'll do later. For now, stay on scholarly. Then move your capital back to the old capital and we're good to go. From here, it's all about just waiting until you can vassalize everyone. We're going to stay on the scholarly court type for now just because it helps us gain more lifestyle experience to get a true ruler. But once we begin the actual vassalization process, we're going to be turning on to diplomatic court type, which we can use to get all everyone that we need. For now, you're going to want to build up about a thousand gold. Remember before how I said that the court amenity cost scales with the size of your empire? It's going to be hard to get money later when we're bigger. So get the money now and then save it for when we have to make the Empire of Tibet because remember Tibet will cost a thousand gold to make. For now, build up money and check on your neighbors and see if anyone's invading from outside. It's getting more difficult to vassalize people who are of a different culture and everything from you. So let's hope that no one conquers Tibet from the exterior. Once you've got all the money that you need, go ahead and start vassalizing everybody. Here you can see that basically all of Tibet just falls right under you. The only way that you can be stopped is if someone who you can't vassalize conquered into Tibet, in which case you may have to fight them, or if the region of Tibet is particularly war-torn, because you cannot vassalize anyone who's at war. So, optimal RNG would have there being no wars in Tibet and no outside invaders. If that's the case, you'll be able to click through everything and then you're good to go. Once you actually reach maximum grandeur, by the way, for the diplomatic vassalization bonus, you can go ahead and drop your amenities back to nothing so you can save your money. In my case, I went as far as to delete my men at arms as well to save all the money that I could because sometimes people won't quite be willing to get vassalized, especially tribal rulers. And if that's the case, you can send them money and that will help them be more willing to get vassalized. Outside of that, it's basically just luck. Worst case scenario, you have to do a couple wars. In my case, I ended up having to do one holy war, which I swapped to Ashari Islam to be able to do the holy war for so I could get the last couple counties that I needed. In your case, hopefully you won't. But yeah, once you make the Tibetan Empire, you're done, the achievement, and we can move on to the next one. This run I'm pretty excited for because this one actually went through some pretty radical alterations since Fate of Iberia and since Royal Court. This one is called Last Count, First King. This requires you to as Duke Nuno of Portugal to form Portugal. 
The estimate for this run is about 40 minutes to an hour, and this actually is a very difficult achievement now with the new requirements with the new DLCs. Before we get so deep into this run, I have a couple preliminary notes to talk about, and one is that you have to complete this achievement as Duke Nuno, so you can't do it as one of his descendants, you have to actually be him. Two is that this run is a little bit RNG dependent, so in other runs RNG might help you accomplish it faster, but here if you don't have any children to make alliances with, you simply are going to have a, a nearly impossible time playing off the achievement. And third is that having the Fate of Iberia DLC makes this run harder. So if you don't have Fate of Iberia, this run actually is easier. Nonetheless, I'll be presenting this achievement as if you have Fate of Iberia, just because I think it's more complete that way. All right, those are my notes. Let's move on to the actual character creation part. So the character that we create for this run is actually very different than what we normally do. We're not going to be creating an opponent, nor are we going to be creating the character that we play as. We're going to be creating a vassal for ourselves, who we're going to set up in such a way that we can inherit their land from them to help us with the run. So the Count of Kulmaria, or Coimbra as it would be called if you're not speaking Arabic, is basically a guy that's married to our daughter at the beginning of the run. He takes up this alliance slot with our daughter. So we're going to swap him out with a custom character who we're going to make focus on making money. This custom character is going to have no family, and therefore their heir will be us. So if we give them a bunch of traits that make them better at making money and make them a good steward, we can inherit their money from them and use that money to create men at arms to help us with our run. So when it comes to making this character, just make him a very old, but not too old, you want him to live for a little while to make some money, a character that will have high stewardship and have traits like greedy and have traits like avaricious because that way they'll make a bunch of money and then we'll be set up to inherit them. This will allow us to both free up our daughter for a, a marriage alliance and to build up some extra cash in the beginning of the game. So once you do that, we'll head in. In previous patches, Nuno was a randomized character who could have stats ranging from awful to amazing and could have a focus in any of the trees, but in the most recent patch, Nuno is now a preset character who will always focus on intrigue. But we're going to focus on wealth because ultimately what matters for this run is generating enough money to get the men at arms to help you win wars alongside using allies to win wars for you too. Once you've selected your focus, our next goal is to get rid of the person who's married to our daughter. So go ahead and work on that. You should hopefully be able to pull it off, but if not, you may have to restart because we desperately need that daughter for a marriage. The next thing you're going to do is go talk to your liege while modifying your feudal contract, and we're going to get the council rights. We'll use those rights first to become the spy master so that we can assassinate our daughter's husband faster. Then we'll use those rights to become the steward so we can get more income. Once the assassination goes through, cross your fingers and hope you get it, and then we have to find an alliance. The best possible option you can get is to get alliance with Toledo. It's the Muslim kingdom, or duchy in this case, right in the middle of Spain, which will be right there to help you in many wars. They're very powerful and they're very useful for you. Because we're in the opportunity phase of Fate of Iberia, we can easily ally with them. Other options that are good would be people like France, someone like Castile maybe. You could go for England, but England's going to be stuck in some wars up in you know England, so that'll be a bit tough to make work right away. Surprisingly enough, the Duke of Bohemia can be a good option. And then from there, you can check your own individual preferences. You may be able to find someone else, but Toledo is your prime target. Once you've got your alliance of choice, the run is now all about blitzing through all of the duchies in Portugal and making a crap ton of money so that we can make all the duchies and the kingdom of Portugal that we need to make for the achievement before we die. Because Nuno, unfortunately, is pretty old right off the bat. So we don't have a whole lot of time. This is also why we made the character before who has a bunch of money or he should at least be making money right now that will inherit the land and money of later. Using a combination of the wealth focus and of being the steward for our king in Galicia, we should make a pretty solid amount of money as we go, but we do actually need a lot of money because to make the kingdom of Portugal, you need to have all the duchies in the Portuguese borders, so that's four duchies, that's a thousand gold right there. Then the decision itself costs 300 gold. So in total, we're going to need 1300 gold before factoring in the expenses of actually being at war and also having to use gifts or whatever you got to do. So we're going to need a lot of money. I highly recommend using the extort subjects interaction to get a lot of money. I highly recommend talking to the Pope about getting money. Whatever you can do, I'd recommend doing. Check your prison often for prisoners to ransom, and if you're doing all those things, you should have enough money by the time you are able to form Portugal. Besides making money, continue to advance southwards to, towards Algarve in the south of Portugal, and with Toledo, you should win every war that you need to. If you 
come across any particular realm that has a lot of alliances themselves, because our Muslims have multiple wives, so they can make a lot of alliances all at once, I'd recommend getting some extra alliances from other parts of Europe, like the previously mentioned France, Bohemia, England, whatever you have to do. You could do it via a betrothal, and if you're worried about getting called into wars you don't want to help with, you can break the betrothals after you're done using your ally, which is very scummy, but gotta do what you gotta do to make Portugal, am I right? Another effective strategy is to simply murder the ruler if they have a lot of alliances. You can't always pull it off, but if you can, then you'll be completely safe. Um, one issue that can pop up is that you might find a realm that has also allied Toledo, so you can't call Toledo in to help you. But, if you call in Toledo before the other guy calls in Toledo, they'll help you. So, you can take a little bit of a gamble and declare the war anyway, hoping that Toledo will join you first. If you're not into gambling though, then consider killing that ruler, or finding other allies to fight that guy instead. Up to you. That's pretty much it at this point. Do the conquest, make the money, and then you're good to go. One thing to remember is that if you're in the opportunity phase of the struggle, you can create the Kingdom of Portugal even if you're a vassal. So if you've been fast enough that the struggle phase hasn't changed, then don't worry about getting independence even if Galicia has been conquered by someone else. So long as you have the land personally within your realm, you're good. You can form Portugal. So that's last count first king. It's a pretty tough achievement. Hopefully you'll do well on your first try. You may have to do some resets for the RNG, but all we can do is hope, right? Let's move on to the next achievement, boys. Okay, now it's Rurik time. For this achievement, we've got a very fun one. This one takes a bit of time, and it's called Land of the Rus. It requires you to start as Rurik the Troublemaker, you have to lead your dynasty to rule the Empire of Russia. We're doing this in concert with another achievement called Vladimir's Second Choice, which requires you to start as a North Germanic Asatruan, which is what Rurik the Troublemaker is, of any kind, and convert to any Islamic faith, and convert all of the Russian region to any Islamic faith. This one is fun, I personally really enjoy it, and it has a possibility to be either pretty damn fast, or it can really drag on. That's why the estimate is 1 hour to 2 hours. Let's get right into it, boys. For this run, we've got no character to create, so we're going to jump in immediately as Rurik, and... Basically, this run is going to be all about war, so in terms of advice I can give you, I have a couple things I can tell you, but beyond that, this is going to be about declaring wars all the time, and because you're a Satruan, you're not going to have to worry about offensive war penalties, so you'll be very well off here. So, the first advice I want to give you is that whenever you conquer someone, do not take duchy wars if you would result in getting vassals of the wrong culture and wrong religion. We're going to need to maintain a pretty stable empire, and we're going to have to get them to convert to Islam later, so we want people who will like us. This means you may have to declare county conquests over and over and over again to ensure that you don't get any vassals of wrong religion and wrong culture. As a tribal, revoking land is much harder than as feudal, so because of that, you really don't want any bad vassals. You start off with a couple, and you can get them to convert if you want, or you can leave them for there and hope that they'll convert with you later. But for now, declare a bunch of county conquests. The second piece of advice I'd give you is that a lot of the Ukonusko and Finnic sort of people in this region have some really overpowered archer units, but you as a Viking have Huskarls, and Huskarls counter archers, so using a lot of Huskarls will really carry you in this run. You're gonna get upset with me for this one, but basically that's all I can tell you, because this run is literally just declaring war over and over and over and over and over and over again until you get the achievement. It's possible to complete this achievement within the lifetime of Rurik, uh, it's not very likely, so I'd recommend that you do prepare for succession. The only tough war is going to be against Khazaria, who you can use your Invade Kingdom CB on to only have to defeat once. The only problem using that is you're going to get some vassals, um, but you know, it's easier than having to fight Khazaria over and over again, so it's worth it. One little note that I'll tell you is that the there's a little piece of Russia in the Russia region that's outside of the de jure empire borders of Russia, and that is Galicia Volhynia. That kingdom in the current patch is in the Empire of West Slavia, but in the current patch of the game, it's still part of the region of Russia. So if you conquer all of the Empire of Russia, you're not actually done. You have to also conquer the Kingdom of Galicia Volhynia, because that's part of the region of Russia. So keep that in mind. Once you've conquered all of the Empire of Russia and Galicia Volhynia, I know that sounds like a lot, but trust me, it really is as simple as being at war constantly, uh, you're ready to convert to Islam. And the one that I recommend converting to is Karmatianism. And this is because of two things. One is that they're a fundamentalist faith, so they convert faster. And two is that they have mendicant preachers, so they convert even faster. So they're definitely a solid pick. You're going to be converting a county every year with how good this is. And also because you can pick your own Imam in Islam. So you can pick like a 40 learning character, unlike with, say, a Christian faith where you have to get assigned a priest. Once you have converted, I recommend taking some time to go manage your little county vassals, because hopefully you don't have that many, but you might have some dukes, and those dukes will have counts below them. 
The Counts will not convert to your religion unless the Dukes convert them, but the AI is pretty complacent, so they probably won't. So I recommend just sort of clicking around, seeing who didn't convert, and getting them to convert using the Demand Convert button. If they refuse to, just mark them down for yourself, and know that you gotta have to convert them yourself using your Chaplain later. So that's pretty much the best I can tell you. You can also go down the Theology Perk Tree to get some modifiers to conversion, but they're pretty minuscule, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. Once you create everything, you get the achievement. Um, the only thing that can be weird about this achievement is that sometimes the game doesn't really understand what your culture is. So if you don't get the achievement right away, I recommend changing to Russian culture to ensure that you get it. Also, quit the game and reload it because sometimes that can also weirdly make the achievement pop. I don't know why this particular achievement is weird. This particular one sometimes just will refuse to pop. I don't know why. It's happened to me on speedruns before and it's very annoying when it happens, but sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Let's move on to the next one, boys. This next one is a pretty quick one, it's very simple, it's called Royal Dignity. It requires you to start as Vratislav Premyshlin in 1066 and to lead your dynasty to rule the Kingdom of Bohemia and the Holy Roman Empire. This one is one of those classic character creator into creating a super dumb character into just winning. You know, we've been through this a hundred times, but I'll take you through it anyway. Right when we hop in, we're going to go ahead and make a custom character for the Holy Roman Empire. We're going to make a sinful and hideous woman, because this will make it easy for us to get a claim on her via the Pope, and it'll also make it easy to get her killed, because everyone will dislike her for her ugliness and her sins. So go ahead and make whatever you feel like. Here's what I made. It's not particularly complicated, but once you make it, we'll hop in as the Duke of Bohemia. So our first move is going to be to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem so we can get a bunch of piety. We're not quite going to get enough off of the pilgrimage itself, so we're going to have to wait around a little bit. For your focus, grab the wealth focus just so we can make a little bit more money. And then we're just going to sort of wait. This run takes like five minutes. Once you come back home from your pilgrimage, you're just going to wait around for a little bit of extra piety. And basically there's nothing to do. If you manage to get up to 500 gold, go ahead and make the Kingdom of Bohemia whenever you're ready. No rush. From here you've got two options. You can try to win the election, which is pretty easy to do, or you can try to use a faction. In the case of this run I have here, I'm not really getting any support from my faction, so I'm going to go and murder the Empress, and when she dies, I will inherit the throne. I'm able to do this because I have an electoral vote, and because I have a claim on the title, most people are more willing to vote for me, so you're pretty likely to be able to win. Regardless, whichever which one you choose, it'll be a pretty easy war, or it'll be a pretty quick assassination. Once you have the throne, you will get the achievement, and then we can move on to the next one. Let's go, boys. Next up, we've got one of the new Royal Court achievements, and it's called Rise of the Gurids. It requires you to start as the Duke of Gur in either 867 or 1066, and to conquer the historical Gurid Empire, which is a region outlined that you can look at in the achievement menu with the drop down in the pause menu and all that. One thing about this run is that I've already made a guide to this run in a separate video, but that guide is slightly outdated. It's not that it's for a different patch, well it is a different patch, but not a meaningfully different one. It's that some of the techniques that I use in this guide are going to be better than the other guide. But that being said, the other guide's more in depth. This one's going to be a little more surface level, but with new updated strats. Alright, let's get into it. The estimate for this run is an hour to two hours, by the way. For this run, we're going to use a new strategy in the character creator called the Ashkenazi strat. Ashkenazis in CK3 are the only culture in the base game to have the Bound by Faith tradition, which says that no character of a different faith can inherit titles. So the interesting thing is that the Gurid duchy in 1066 is the only Maturidi Muslim duchy in all of the Ghaznavids. So if we make an Ashkenazi Maturidi ruler, we'll always inherit the Ghaznavid kingdom from them. So what I recommend doing is creating a character that's pretty much going to die immediately, who is of the Ashkenazi culture and the Maturidi faith, and then you'll just simply inherit the kingdom off them right when the game starts. Very easy. Once you're done creating a character, we'll head in as the Duke of Gur. When you get in the game, we're going to pick our focus. Go ahead and grab the Majesty focus right away. The character uh, for the Duke of the Gurids is completely randomized every run, so you may already have Diplomacy perks, or you might not. If you don't, you don't have to reset, but you might choose to if you want. Hopefully you got good traits. If you didn't, maybe reset up to you. The first thing you're going to do in this run is wait until the, the king of the Ghaznavids dies. Once he dies, you inherit the kingdom, then we can do some more stuff. Once the king has died, we can do our next steps. So the first thing you're going to do is go into your court and max out your amenities while your realm is relatively small. That's important because we have to get our grandeur up. The second thing is get yourself an alliance with a powerful ally that you can use to carry you in several upcoming wars. And the third is we're going to start revoking land from the Duchy of Lahore because we want to use that land as our domain because it's some of the best land in the whole game. Those are your first three steps. Once you've got Lahore, go ahead and move your capital to Lahore itself, and we're going to start basically spending time just building up our domain so we can have a strong economy and a strong domain with lots of men-at-arms. This is the part of the runner basically you just wait around. 
This is where you can save time if you're going for a speedrun, where the earlier you can begin the next step, which I'll explain after this part, the faster you can complete the run. But this is all the setup. Obtain Lahora's domain, build it up, have high grandeur, and work on your perks towards getting true rulers so we can start vassalizing people. I've skipped ahead about 20 minutes in the run, purely because the past few minutes have been nothing but waiting around. I've had a few a succession, and that's okay. Basically, you just play the game as you would normally. But once you're ready, go ahead and swear fealty to the Seljuks. Now, how do you know when you're ready? You know you're ready when you have a lot of money, and the Seljuks are starting to fall apart, but haven't fallen apart. One thing that can not kill this run, but make it much harder, is that the Seljuks entirely collapse. Our current strat won't work, and you'll have to just conquer it manually. But if they don't entirely collapse, as long as they're just weak, then you can swear fealty to them and take them over from the inside using meritocracy. So go ahead and get the meritocracy perk, and then start fabricating a claim on the empire, then we'll become a claimant, then we'll claim our spot on the throne, and so on and so forth, and you'll become the Seljuk Emperor. The Seljuks presumably will not just give you the throne, they're probably going to fight a war for it, which can be tough, but honestly, the Seljuks tend to fall into massive civil war pretty fast, especially if you've been greasing the wheels by killing some emperors over and over again. So you should win eventually, but this war might take a bit of time. Either way though, it's okay. As long as you win at the end of the day, then you'll become the Seljuk Emperor. Once you have the Persian Empire title, you'll pretty much have all the land that you need in the western part of the Gurid Empire. But if you're missing anything, you may even be able to vassalize people around you that are within the borders of the historical Gurid Empire. Convert to Ashari Islam if they're not willing to go with you. But either way, you should be able to get it done pretty easily just by conquering them normally if you can't do it by vassalization. So now I've got the western half of the empire, let's go focus on the eastern half. It's going to be a much easier process to get the eastern half. We're going to basically be using the vassalization strats that we've used in other runs before to pull this off. So you're going to want to get a diplomatic court, and you can obtain that by either changing cultures to an egalitarian or stoic culture, or you can diverge your culture and make it egalitarian, whatever works better for you. You're going to do that and raise your grandeur to maximum with the diplomatic court type. You're going to try to have the true ruler perk. Now, we've been working on other perks, so you probably have meritocracy, you probably got a few, but if you got to wait around to get true ruler, it's fine. Regardless, you don't actually need true ruler, it just makes it easier. The big thing that matters is the diplomatic court and having max grandeur. Once you do have max grandeur and diplomatic court, we're going to switch religions to being Samarta, which is a particular kind of Hinduism which is actually less common than others. We want to be a kind of Hinduism that no one else is, so that we can vassalize using religious exemptions very easily. Because most of the Hindus around are maybe willing to support you, if you're the same form of Hinduism. But if you're different, they'll only dislike you a little bit for being astray, but they'll definitely be really happy to have a religious exemption vassalization. At this point, it's going to be a simple matter of appeasing the various kings around, because the dukes will immediately fall under you, there's no question of that. But guys like like the Chohan uh, Kingdom and the Pala Kingdom over in Bengal, they're going to be a little more resistant. If you can get them to like you a lot, give them religious exemption, have max grandeur, all that stuff, they should say yes. Now, if they don't, if they're being, if they just, for whatever reason, you cannot convince them to, then consider going to war and conquering them. It may be faster, but for the most part, vast, they should be much faster. Go ahead and just check and see who you can get. If you're missing anyone, war them. If you can get everyone vassalization, perfect, you're done. But, you know, do what you got to do. That's basically the run now, and from there, I think you guys can handle it yourselves. So, best of luck. Hopefully you can vast everyone. If not, do some wars, and then you're done. GG. Let's look at the next achievement, boys. Next up is an extremely quick, extremely easy run. We have to get the achievements Above God, which requires us to have a strong hook on our Head of Faith, and Trapped in the Web, which requires us to have a strong hook on three direct vassals. This run takes like two minutes. It's nothing. Let's get it done real quick. I'm going to make a custom character for the Abbasid Empire who has really nothing special about him except that he has an intrigue uh, education and that he is pretty old and has a bunch of intrigue. Go ahead and make that character, nothing special to do, then we drop right in. The moment you get into the game, go ahead and pick the intrigue focus, take the entire left hand side tree, and then start uh, checking for secrets in your capital using the highest intrigue courtier you can find. When you check for secrets as an intrigue focused character, you will be able to get strong hook fabrications on random courtiers in your realm. What we're looking for is three male courtiers who we can grant land to, to get strong hooks on. Then from there, I think you can see where this is going, but in case you can't, when you get three people, go ahead and give each one of them a single county, and then give the last one the Sunni Caliphate. And there you go, then you get both achievements. Easy clap, next achievement. For this next run, we've got Give a Dog a Bone, which requires you to start as Matilda di Canossa in 1066, and to lead your dynasty to rule the Kingdom of Italy. You have to have at least 50 dynasty members and found a holy order. This run takes about 40 minutes to an hour, 
And it's relatively simple, but it is simply time consuming because of that 50 Dynasty members, that just takes time. So it's a long one, but a simple one. Let's get into it. For the beginning, we are of course going to make a custom character for the Holy Roman Empire this time. This is because although we're only required to become the king or queen of Italy, we're actually going to be becoming the empress of the Holy Roman Empire just because that way we can have even more power for ourselves. So go ahead and create our classic incompetent female sinner content craven catholic non-germanic person that we always make for the hre and then we'll go ahead and depose them with a papal claim all this stuff you guys know how this goes we've been doing this many times once your character is ready we'll go ahead and jump in as matilda the duchess of tuscany for this running guide a couple different options for your focuses but i always go temptation because that way you get more fertility and you can actually seduce a bunch of people to get more and more pregnancies. Ultimately, we're not really going to be caring about being a, a good Christian in this run. We're going to be having as many kids as possible because the bottleneck for your speedrun in this case is definitely the 50 Dynasty members. You can make a Holy Order pretty fast. You can be King of Italy almost immediately. It's those kids that are going to take forever. So go Temptation and start seducing a lot of people. Beyond that, we're going to go ahead and get a pilgrimage to get a massive amount of piety so that we can claim the title of the Holy Roman Empire from our Sinner Liege. And then beyond that, this is basically going to be played as a regular game of CK3. Upgrade your domain, pick good husbands who are going to have, you know, good inheritable traits. The only difference is now, you're going to be seducing a crap ton of people because you want to get those pregnancies going. Other than that though, play it like a regular game. Once you decide to claim the Holy Roman Empire, we're going to go ahead and go through with that, but we're not actually planning to keep the Holy Roman Empire. You're going to grab it, and then you're going to spend some money on creating the Kingdom of Italy, and then you're just going to be done with it. You're probably going to get deposed almost right away because, you know, you're Italian and most of your subjects are all Germans and they're not going to like you much. So they're going to put you on the throne. Then they're going to immediately try to take you off of it. But let them take you off of it. It doesn't matter. Just make Italy while you're still the emperor so you can have that part of the achievement done. What I like to do as well, because I'm, I'm a bit of a troll, I like to have a bit of fun, is I also make a lot of the other kingdoms in the empire so that I can be this massive sub-king of all of the empire and then be this huge vassal no one can target. It's just fun. You don't have to do that. The only title you have to make is the kingdom of Italy. By the way, fun thing about the achievement followed by Sh Shadows is that you can get it pretty easily by just having 10 lovers because the secrets that you know about your own relationships count as secrets. So oh, you're going to be able to get that achievement in this run, even if you didn't get it in other runs, pretty passively by just getting a bunch of lovers. So that's a nice little bonus. This run also is a great way to obtain the Succession is Safe achievement because having 10 kids when you're constantly sleeping around is pretty easy. I got it in my run. You may not necessarily get it. It's going to depend on a bit of luck, but we'll be getting it in future runs anyway. But in case you want to get it early, here it is now. So you've got the Empire, you've got a pretty good domain, you've got a crap ton of lovers, but Matilda can only have so many kids before she is no longer able to have children anymore. So what do you do to get to 50 Dynasty members? Well, of course, got to get your entire family married off basically the moment they can get married. Women have to marry matrilineally, men got to marry patrilineally, and you just get them married off right away, particularly focusing on getting them spouses that are beautiful or handsome or comely because those characters will have higher fertility base. So you definitely want to do that. And also, if you can, grant lands to them. Now, I didn't do this in my run because I didn't think about it at the time that I was doing my All Achievements run. But now that I've had more time to consider it, if you give land to people, they're more likely to get married and have kids because they just do more things. They also might take on lovers, whatever they're going to do. So basically, you want to land your, fa your, your dynasty members as much as you can and make sure they're all married so you can speed up the process. After this, we're going to focus on founding a holy order. You've got a couple different options for getting the piety to make a holy order. The big ones are winning a crusade. If you can pull that off, you'll pretty much instantly get all the piety that you need, assuming that you are the number one participant, which is very easy to get. The problem is that in today's patch of CK3, winning crusades is almost impossible, so it's unlikely to happen. The other way is a combination of pilgrimages and building temples. Now, funnily enough, okay, you're going to have a lot of money at this point in the game because you're part of one of the richest areas of Italy, so you're going to have a lot of money. Use that money to just build a crap ton of churches. If you're still the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, if you haven't lost the throne, you can get a lot of money out of taxes from your vassals. So just get a crap ton of money and build up a crap ton of temples, and each one gives 500. But remember, you only get the piety if the temple is built in a county that's part of your domain. So don't build temples anywhere. Build them in the little sub baronies that are empty that are part of counties that you own. So for example, in Firenze, you own that county, and there's a couple of blank areas there. You can build temples there to get 500 piety apiece. 
A mixture of pilgrimages and temples will get you the piety that you need. What you can also do to make sure you get the devotion that you need for it is try to break up with all of your lovers once you're past the age of 45. Past 45, women cannot have children in CK3 unless they're pregnant at 45 and aged into 46. But beyond that, they cannot have children. So break up with all your lovers, and that way you won't get accused of being an uh, adulteress and all that. Then, your last step is to wait until enough people are part of your family. This will simply take time, so go ahead and AFK and wait until your family reproduces. You may end up passing away as Matilda. I often am unable to get to 50 Dynasty members in one life. So if you pass away and you're playing as a man, men are able to have a lot more kids than women for very obvious reasons. So if you play as a man, grab that temptation focus and just seduce like everyone and legitimize every bastard. You'll be seen as a horrible person in the Christian society, but you get the achievement faster, so it's worth it. Once you got all the people, you have a holy order, you have Italy, and you have the number of dynasty members that you need. So the achievement is done, and we can move on to the next one. This next one's another royal court achievement, and it's called Turkish Eagle. It requires you to, as the Seljuk Count in Samosata, to form room and create a hybrid culture between Greek and Oas. Keep in mind that it can be a hybrid culture between a divergence of Greek and a divergence of Oas. You can be one culture separated from it. The estimate for this run is an hour to an hour and a half. Let's get into it. For our custom character, we're going to do pretty much what we always do, and that is make a custom character for our biggest enemy, that is the Byzantine Empire. We're going to give him the all the classic traits of eight marshals who he'll lead armies, we'll make him one-legged, disfigured, all this stuff. Uh, it'll make it easier to fight the Byzantine army later. That being said, um, the only concern about this is that we're not going to be able to fight the Byzantines for quite a while because they build up our own strength. So this character may end up passing away or getting dethroned before we can actually use him, but regardless, just in case we can use him, we'll put him in there. Once you're done, we'll drop in as the Count Suleiman of Samosada. He is a Count underneath the Duke of Edessa. Your immediate move once you're in the game is start fabricating a claim on the various lands around you that your liege owns. So we're under the Duke of Edessa, who is underneath the Empire of the Persian Emperor, and we need to become you know, free from that and become a Duke ourselves. This is so that we can get better alliances through marriage, and also because we can have the domain to increase our income and power. So. Go ahead and fabricate a claim on Aintab or Edessa or Amida. Fighting the other vassals underneath the Duchy of Edessa and the Duke of Edessa himself is really easy because you start the game with special troops. So go ahead and declare the wars and go ahead and take all the stuff that you need. It's going to be a little bit slow, so you kind of have to just live with the fact that this run starts off kind of slow. But once you get it, we can start really snowballing. When you declare war on the actual Duke of Edessa, you're going to be considered a criminal in his eyes and you'll probably should arrest you. But you have four counties, he has one. So just say no, and then get him deposed by winning the war against him. This will have the double effect of not putting you in jail, and also resetting your truce, because of course the new character that comes after the deposition will not have a truce with you. Then you can conquer the last piece of Edessa, and you will become independent, and then you have to make the actual duchy of Edessa. It takes a little bit of money, but if you've been getting prisoners, you should have some cash. If not, you may just have to wait around until you have money, which sucks, but gotta do what you gotta do. So funnily enough, I'm making this guide using a clip from my live stream where I did all achievements in one sitting. But I actually made a big mistake in this run, and that is that I never did make the Duchy of Edessa. I simply continued playing as a Count and got alliances wherever I could, and then I went and conquered a piece of the Byzantine Empire, which I'll show you very soon. When I did that, I started giving away the vassals, not realizing that I was in fact not a Duke, and therefore was simply making more independent Counts. So, take a lesson from me here. Don't be stupid. Make the Duchy of Edessa. Don't forget to do that. So once you're actually ready to go to war with the Byzantines, which you should be ready once you have a bunch of alliances, this is where the game gets very frustrating because you are entirely dependent on your allies helping you. You cannot defeat the Byzantines by yourself, so the allies have to be there to help you. But of course, the AI in this game is um, questionable, I would say, at best. And because of that, try to guide them wherever you can, but they're inevitably going to lose you some battles. Uh, if you end up actually losing your first war to the Byzantines and having to pay them a crap ton of money, I would say just reset. But what you're hoping for is to kind of lure the Byzantines out into flatlands, because you have a bunch of horse archers who will absolutely slaughter them in flatlands. You want to lure them out, and then fight them with your allies in the flatlands, and then win at least one battle. If you win one battle, then you're going to really start wearing them down, and also the Byzantines' income will start going down. When they're reinforcing their men-at-arms, they're going to need a lot more money. And if they don't have money, their troops are going to be weaker, whereas you probably are going to have a pretty healthy economy. So, continuously try to lure them out from the mountains, and fight them in plains, and then you should be okay. This is tough though, this part of the run is very tough. I recommend actually getting some pikemen men-at-arms, because that way they can kind of counteract those really strong cataphracts, and also if you get caught in a mountain battle, pikemen aren't as you know horrible in mountains as horse archers are, so it can kind of give you a nice little buffer against accidental mountain battles and against cataphracts. 
With luck, you'll just capture the Vision Emperor and the war will be over. Um, but that requires luck, of course. So, you know, best of luck with that, I guess you could say. Can I say luck more than three times in a sentence, please? Once the war is over, here's the mistake that I made. I did not take a duchy, so because of that, I ended up just giving away the land that I just took. But if you do do that, if you happen to make the exact same mistake as me, then go ahead and fabricate claims on those can those vassals that you just created, and then you can get your land back. It's much easier to fight them one-on-one -on -one than it is to fight the Vincent Emperor, so you're still up, you still have gained, but obviously you don't want to have to waste money on claim fabrications. But oh well, it's not the end of the world. You're also going to want to diverge your culture, simply because it's easier to create a hybrid culture if you have egalitarian ethos and if you're smaller. We don't want to be always because that's a really big culture that'll be hard to get acceptance with, whereas if we have a one-county diverging culture, we can easily hybridize that with Greek for way, way less acceptance. So go ahead and do that. So once you've, uh, in my case, reconquered those guys that you let go, we're going to keep fighting the Byzantines over and over again. We want to keep the pressure on them because the more debt they're in, the worse off they are. So, continuously declare wars on them while avoiding truce breaks. We're not ready to truce break yet, but later we will. And just keep the pressure going. The only problem is as we advance further into Anatolia, more and more of the territory becomes mountains, and we suck at fighting in mountains. So, you know, we're going to hope that we have more allies that can help us fight in this mountainous terrain, but you're going to have a harder time with wars as you go. The way to alleviate that is as you go, build more and more men at arms, focusing on pikemen and horse archers. Those are the two best units that you can build for this particular situation. You may also want some light footmen just as some padding, because light footmen can be nice to counter heavy infantry and also just increase your numbers a lot and to help with sieges. You're going to repeat this process over and over again until you actually get all the land that you need, but along the way you're probably going to have a succession. So when you play as your heir, you're going to hope that you had a good heir. Uh, if you didn't, then you know that really sucks, but you can still do this. Obviously, you want to have only one heir, that'd be best, and because you're a Muslim, you can easily imprison and execute your own children without getting any real negatives. So go ahead and do that. It's going to be tyrannical, but it's worth it to avoid splitting. Beyond that, the last piece of advice I have to give is whenever you conquer a Greek piece of territory, always give it to a Greek person to increase acceptance with your current culture, because every time you declare war on the Byzantines, you're going to be decreasing your acceptance. So go ahead and, you know, give like land to Greeks and that way they like you more and then hopefully it'll outweigh it. You can also use the Royal Court Hold Court button to try and get more acceptance because occasionally events in there will give you a lot of acceptance. If you can get those, that'd be absolutely amazing. Of course, you can't do that until you're a king. So once you actually do form the Sultanate of Rum, that's when you can try that strategy. Once you are the Sultan of Rum, if you haven't gotten the acceptance that you need throughout time, uh, you just have to wait for the acceptance to build up. You can use your steward to increase acceptance, and you can keep holding court, hoping to get those good events. In my case, I got that really good acceptance event basically right away, so I was able to end the achievement pretty fast. For you, it might take some time, but once you've got it, you can create divergent culture, and then you're good. Let's go on the next achievement. Next up is a classic. It's called Wily as the Fox. It requires you to start as Robert the Fox in 1066, and to locate of Sicily, and control a Greek kingdom, and convert it all to Catholicism. I actually have a dedicated guide to this run on my channel already that is up to date. So I'm going to go over this run in this video, but if you want a more in-depth guide that's longer and more detail oriented, go ahead and check out the video in the top right. Similar to Rise of the Gurids, we're going to use the same technique from that run. We're going to make an Ashkenazi Catholic Emperor Byzantine Empire, and then we're going to swear fealty to them and inherit the entire empire. So it doesn't matter what you make the character here, just make them Ashkenazi culture, Catholic religion, and then give them a bunch of traits that'll make them die very quickly. And then the first move we'll do as Robert the Fox is swear fealty to the Byzantine Emperor. Boom, we're immediately the Empire. Once you're the Emperor, we're going to do an interesting strategy that you might think is kind of weird. We're going to have to build up a little bit of cash first, and then we're going to make the Kingdom of Bulgaria. And you'll see why we're doing that very soon. We're going to get the Kingdom of Bulgaria to the Duke of Philippopolis because he is Cravens. He will never rise up against us. Go and grant it to him, and then we're going to do something that's going to look a little bit insane. We're going to grant every single vassal that we have, except for any vassals in Hellas, the kingdom in the south of Greece. We're going to give all vassals to the King of Bulgaria. This is going to cause you an immense amount of stress as an ambitious and greedy character. So what's going to happen is, this is an opportunity for them to die. You may simply keel over from a heart attack and pass away and GG, you have to restart. That may happen, but we're going to hope it doesn't. There may also be some vassals who are involved in wars. Those vassals cannot be transferred. If that happens, then that kind of sucks, but it's okay, you can still make the run work. If you can get every vassal in there, then that's the optimal run. Now it's tyranny time. We're going to go ahead and retract vassalage of the Count of Uboya from the Aegean Island Duke. 
And that's going to probably start a little civil war. We're hoping that everyone who is not Bulgaria rises up because the only people who aren't Bulgaria in our realm are the vassals in the Kingdom of Hellas. If that happens, it's an optimal run. If not, you're going to have to commit more tyranny, but oh well. Go ahead and do that and then win the civil war by using your troops and also just grab yourself an alliance with someone like France. They can just carry you in the war and then you're good to go. Once you've won the war, we're going to just revoke everything from everyone that's in prison. All vassals revoke all the land indiscriminately, and then whoever didn't rise up in the previous war, go ahead and revoke land from them and do another civil war. Since some of these dukes have counts below them, you're going to have to do one more civil war after this one where you revoke the land of the counts who are underneath the dukes that you just revoked, and once you have the entirety of the Kingdom of Hellas as your domain, we can advance to our next step. So the step after this is going to make use of the fact that there's a certain way that things work in CK3 about county conversion. If a character converts religion, then all of their vassals will have a choice to either convert or not convert. If a vassal chooses to convert, and his capital county is the same religion as he was before converting, then his capital will change religions to the new religion he's converting to. So what we're going to do is we're going to convert to Orthodox Christianity, and then grant away all of the land in the Kingdom of Hellas to Orthodox people. Preferably, people who will actually like you. So consider giving it to like your children, or giving it to random courtiers who you can you know, seduce or romance and that kind of stuff so they actually like you. In my case, I got a bit lazy, gave it to anyone, and I chose to convert manually. But basically, we're going to give land away to Orthodox people, and then we're going to convert to Catholicism afterwards. And since every piece of Hellas is a capital county, and every capital county will be converting to Catholicism with you, all the land will convert instantaneously to Catholicism. This doesn't always work out because Robert the Fox by this point is going to be hated simply because you've been a huge tyrant, so you're hoping that'll work. If it doesn't, just send the court chaplain to go convert and do it slow. It's going to be a less optimal speed run, but it will be a pretty good run for an all achievement run. Once you've done that, the run is over and we can move on to the next one. Quick side note, if you're as slow as me, a crusade might trigger, and if you participate in the crusade, you can also get yourself first to the crusader kings in this run. Pretty convenient. Next up is a quick one, we're going to be doing Emerald Isle, which requires you to start as an Irish ruler and become King of Ireland. This runs nice and quick and easy, we're going to go into the 1066 start and go play as the Duke of Munster and create a Norse Irish character who can just county conquest his way through all of Ireland. Then we just make some money, make the kingdom title, and we're done. Alright, so like my notes for this run are pretty much just like, what are you doing, this is so easy, just just conquer Desmond. Conquer Athlone, conquer Ossery, conquer Brief, and you conquer Oriole, wherever you go, just conquer everything that's easy to conquer. Check for alliances to make sure there's nobody allied to like France that can come and kill you, and this will be a really easy run. Once you've conquered the land that you need, you can go ahead and make a second duchy. You should have enough land to make at least one other duchy. Then you can make the kingdom. You can either wait for money because you're going to have a big domain limit because you picked a lot of stewardship in the character creator, or you can go raiding because you're a saw true, so you can go raiding. But beyond that, I mean... That's it, really. And then you make the title, and then you're done. Easy clap. Let's look at the next one. Now we have another quick one. This one's called Carolingian Consolidation. It requires you to start as a Carling and be the only Carling to hold a landed title. This one takes just a few moments to finish, so let's get to it. So all we do in this run is we create a custom character for the Kingdom of France. We make them a sinner, a woman, a foreign culture, and a foreign religion. Although in my recording here, I forgot to change the religion, but you don't have to even do that to make the run work, so don't worry, it's optional, I guess. But in your run, make it another religion as well. Then, when you get into the game, you drop in as the Count of Vermandois, who's the last Carling in 1066, and then you just immediately make a independence faction. You can ask for a, the council rights on your contract to get access to becoming Chancellor. If you're a Chancellor, you'll increase the opinion of other vassals of you, so they're more likely to join your faction. The way CK3 is made in today's patches for the first 10-ish uh, years, it, it's weird, so it doesn't always line up this way, but for the first 10-ish years, the chance of any given character joining a faction is significantly lowered. So you may have to wait around 10 years for the real independence faction to really grow. But this France will tend to get attacked by outside people. And if you gave the Queen of France a bunch of craven content and, and evil traits, they're going to be more likely to give in to your demands even if you don't have a lot of power. So you can be waiting for one of two things. You're either waiting for an outside power to attack France and weaken them such that they go into debt, or you're waiting those 10 years so that vassals will join your faction. Whichever comes first, you hit the enforce demands button, and then you should just be given independence. In my case, just to troll, I decided to also claim the Kingdom of France and then become the King of France, but you don't have to do that, you just gotta be independent. And once you've done that, you're good to go. Quick achievement, one and done, let's move on to the next one. 
This next run is a lot of fun, I really enjoyed this one. It's composed of three main achievements. The first two are Blood Eagle, which requires you to start as any child of Ragnar Lodbrok and conquer all of the British Isles. And the second is Mikligar Thriki, which requires you to start as a North Germanic Asatruan and control the Kingdom of Thessalonica and hold any empire except the Byzantine Empire. The third achievement in this run is Knut the Greater, which requires you to, as an underformed tribal, take the decision to secure the High Kingdom of the North Sea. It's explicitly because of this achievement that our estimate is an hour to two and a half hours, which is a big range, because it's very easy to get really close to ending this run, and then your character passes away before you can pass the decision, causing you to have to wait 30 more years. So the range is quite wide on this one. Either way, let's get into it. When it comes to character creation for this run, um, the consensus in the community is actually really decided. You have a couple different options. In my run, I chose to go with the creating an amazing custom commander in the Isle of Man, but you can also create a Norse Asatri character in Wessex that you can vassalize very easily. So for the purpose of this guide, I'll go over the one that I chose to do in my run, which was the commander in Man, but you can also try other strategies that you can find out by talking to other speedrunners in the community and checking out the speedrun Discord. The idea behind what we're doing with the Isle of Man characters, we're going to make ourselves an extremely high martial, extremely skilled uh, character that we can use as a general to fight wars for us very successfully. Normally in CK3, a character is limited to having three commander traits at any given time, but in the character creator, you can add it as many as you want. So we can get all the good ones, aggressive attacker, we can get strategist, we can get defensive fighter, we can get siege leader, we can get organizer, we can get reaver, all that good stuff. And we can also give this guy a really good martial score and then simply use him as a commander. With that being said, uh, it's not always the most effective purely because in this run, your bottleneck is not winning battles, it's sieges. So what's more important is getting command that can siege well, but nonetheless, it can be useful to have this good commander anyway. Once you've done that, we're going to drop in as Ivar the Boneless up in the Isles. For this run, the most difficult achievement to get is Knut the Greater, simply because you have to hold England, Denmark, and Norway for 30 years to get Knut the Greater. This is very difficult, so I would recommend that you go for England right away. Luckily, we're already at war with East Anglia and Northumbria. We're going to focus on East Anglia first, then we'll fight Northumbria after. These wars should be relatively easy, and once they're over, we're going to focus on getting enough fame to declare duchy conquests. Right now, we could go invade Mercia, but we don't want to have all these truce timers con stopping us. So instead, we're going to focus on Ireland for the time being, and go ahead and grab all the stuff in there because it's very quick and easy wars to get a bunch of fame. That fame is what we'll use to be able to declare wars for duchies in Mercia. Once we take Mercia, we'll be able to almost make England right away. Once you have the fame level to declare duchy wars, go for Mercia immediately. Mercia is a gigantic duchy that will get you a bunch of land in England that we can use to create the actual kingdom. Along the way to that fame, you should have conquered maybe about half of Ireland, a little bit of Wales, and a piece of Cornwall maybe, and you should ignore Wessex until we're strong enough to fight them. For now, Wessex could kick our ass. They probably wouldn't, but it's a risk, so why take the risk? Let's focus on Mercia first. Once you've got Mercia, you should now have a pretty large chunk of England. We can probably go after Wessex at this point, although what you could try to do first is become the King of Ireland or Scotland. You can become King of Ireland by just creating the title, or you can subjugate Scotland. At some point, we're going to subjugate Scotland, but you don't have to do it right away. We can do it later. The reason we might do this is so that we can vassalize Jorvik. If we vassalize Jorvik, we'll gain a little bit of strength for ourselves, but beyond that, it won't help us too much. If you think you can't take Wessex, then go for Norway and Denmark, because Norway and Denmark are very disunited and you can easily conquer them. If you think you can take Wessex though, then feel free to try invading them. Don't use your invade kingdom on them, because we're going to save it for later when we go for Mikligar 3 key. For now, just take duchies out of them, preferably the duchy of Wessex itself, because that's where all of Alfred's domain is. If you take his domain, he'll be defanged and you can just take him over very easily in subsequent wars. Don't be afraid, by the way, to get some alliances temporarily using betrothals to help you against Alfred, and then just break the betrothals later, or if they're not betrothals, assassinate the person that's causing the alliance, because you might be allied to people who you don't want to get you know, called into wars with. So, up to you. If you're big brain enough for it, try conquering land in Norway and in England at the same time by declaring simultaneous wars and splitting your army in half. I find that after 11 hours of speedrunning, I don't have the mind for this, so I tend to be pretty single-minded in my wars. But if you want to be like the ultimate god gamer, go for it. Try to conquer in two places at once. It may slow you down if you're constantly having to pause to reevaluate, or it might speed you up if you have the multitasking skills for it. 
Beyond that, the goal in the current sort of view of your run is to get the kingdoms of Denmark, Norway, and England as fast as possible. You can conquer the British Isles at your own pace. You can go for Thessalonica whenever you're ready, but you need to get those kingdoms quickly because to create the High Kingdom of the North Sea Empire, you have to rule all three kingdoms for 30 years. Ivar probably won't make it, so you know, best of luck. Once you have got the three kingdoms, conquering the rest of the British Isles is very easy because you're by far the most powerful person in the entire area. So go ahead and just wipe up whatever's left, taking your time knowing that your bottleneck is those 30 years, so it's okay. The last thing you've got to do before anything else is you have to conquer Thessalonica. Now if you've been saving your Invade Kingdom CB all this time, you can just go and fight the Byzantines once, but we do have to get diplomatic range, so I recommend conquering a county somewhere in Bulgaria or Wallachia, and using that as access to the Byzantines, and then they should fold pretty easily, especially if you have Varangian veterans. Remember that Varangian veterans counter heavy cavalry, and the Byzantines happen to have heavy cavalry in the form of their cataphracts, so Varangian veterans will just absolutely shred them. You should be completely fine. This is where the RNG comes in. If Ivar lives long enough, then you can finish the run in one lifetime. If he doesn't though, as is what happened in my game, and you didn't manage your succession, your realm is going to split into a million pieces and you're going to have to reconquer all of it and this will add a lot of time to your speedrun. It's important to evaluate if you think Ivar will survive. If you think he will, then go ahead and ignore your succession and just get the achievement. If you think he won't though, if you think he's going to die, then do manage your succession. Disinherit the extra kids you have and get rid of people that are old. You don't want to play as a 40 year old and die again. Try to play as like a 20 year old or even a child if you need to. Whatever you need to survive 30 years. There's also a fear of assassination. Now this probably won't happen to you because if you've been conquering in such a way that your vassals mostly are also Norse and Asatru, they won't have a problem with you. But if you have a lot of Catholic Anglo-Saxon vassals or a lot of Catholic Irish or a lot of Catholic Welsh, whatever, then you may have to be fearful of assassination. The best thing you can do to stop it is have a lot of the minor titles that prevent assassinations available, try to have people like you, have a good spy master, all that good stuff, but assassination may happen anyway, and if that's the case, then you're going to have to hope that you can reassemble the realm and try to do well, but beyond that, you can't really do much. Those 30 years are a killer, and if you can survive it, great. If not, then try and try again. That's why the estimate is so wide on this run. Once you do make the Empire, the North Sea Empire, and then you have the King Thessalonica, and you've conquered all the British Isles, you will be done the achievement, and then we can move on to the next one, boys. Alright, so this upcoming run is basically the magnum opus of this achievement run. We're going to be getting six achievements, most of which are from Fate of Iberia, one of which is optional and can be done at a later date, or can be done right now, but it's going to be a little RNG dependent. So the first two are Sibling Rivalry, which requires you to start as any of the Jimena siblings in 1066 and become Emperor of Spain. And the second one is Andalusian Inquisition, which requires you to convert all of Iberia to Mozarabism. The second set is Reconquista, which requires you to start as an Iberian Christian and convert all of Iberia to Christianity. This one lines up really nice with Andalusian Inquisition because Mozarabism is Christianity, so you always get them together. The second one is Iberian Compromise, which requires you to end the Iberian struggle through compromise. And for the last set, we've got High Stakes, which requires you to bet a title on a strategy game match against another ruler and complete the match. Keep in mind that you do not have to win, you just have to complete the match, whether you win or lose. Second, there's Legacy of the Campeadores, which is the optional achievement. It requires you to create and rule Valencia as an heir to El Cid. Important note is that you do not have to actually be the guy that rules Valencia and be the heir to El Cid, so long as anyone, even if it's an AI, rules the Kingdom of Valencia as either El Cid or one of his heirs. It counts. The estimate for this run is about 2 hours to 3.5 hours, and it's very long, and it can be a bit tough, but once you're through the first, I'd say, about half hour, you're good to go. Let's get into it. For character creation, we're going to go ahead and just eliminate one person who could be a big problem for us. We're going to get rid of our brother in the kingdom of Leon, simply because he may get assassinated, he can be a bit of a tough enemy. We're going to replace him with whatever, it doesn't really matter, because we're going to be playing as Sancho who is a military leader, and he is very good at fighting, so we should be able to beat anyone. But just to keep it safe, drop the stats to nothing, make him disfigured, make him one-legged, you, you know the whole thing, you know how to do it by now. So we're playing in Iberia, so that means we have to deal with the Iberian struggle. This makes conquering all of Iberia a little bit harder, and we also have to end the Iberian struggle with the compromise. So the thing is that doing that naturally is pretty tough, so the plan is going to be kind of weird. Allow me to explain. So I'm going to have to put up some diagrams here to sort of explain myself because I worry that my words won't be enough. So get ready for some nice looking pictures. Okay. We run into a few snags with the theoretical idea of this run. Firstly, 
How can we get sibling rivalry if by ending the struggle in a compromise we destroy the title of Empire of Hispania? Remember that when you end the struggle in a compromise, all kingdoms become empires, the Empire of Hispania gets destroyed, and all duchies become kingdoms. So that's a bit of a head scratcher, how can we do that? Well, there's something very interesting about this game that it will forever be weird to me, and that's that the Empire of Hispania actually is not destroyed when you take the compromise decision. What actually happens is it becomes titular. Now, what that means is that it has no de jure counties, so you can't create it by just clicking and clicking create title. But you know how you can give it some de jure counties back is if you avenge the Battle of Tours, which might leave you again scratching your head because thinking, well, aren't we trying to make all of Iberia Christian? How are we going to avenge the Battle of Tours? That's a Muslim decision. Well, we can still avenge the Battle of Tours after having converted the entirety of Iberia to Christianity because to avenge the Battle of Tours, all you have to do is control all of Iberia and control Aquitaine. So, when we avenge the Battle of Tours, what happens is the Kingdom of Aquitaine is added to the Empire of Hispania. Now, this is going to look really, really cursed, but essentially, there's going to be a new Empire of Hispania, which will exist only in Aquitaine, that we can then create after avenging the Battle of Tours. Essentially, in order to get these achievements, we have to follow a certain order of operations. First, El Cid, but again, optional. So first, in theory, is El Cid, but you don't have to necessarily get it. Then, Andalusian Inquisition plus Reconquista, which go hand in hand. Then you have to end the struggle with a compromise. Then you have to avenge the Battle of Tours, which allows you to make the Empire of Hispania. And then finally, you can go for high stakes achievement, but you don't really have to do it at the end. You can do it whenever. The only order that matters is first you convert it into Christianity, then you end the struggle, then you make the Empire. Okay, let's actually get into the run now. All right, so now that we're in the game, our first step immediately as Sancho is to conquer our sibling kingdoms. So Leon and Galicia have to go. Once you've got the big two beside you, now we're going to go for Navarra and Aragon. Navarra, you also have a claim on, but Aragon, you only have claims on their counties, so we're going to have to conquer them one by one by one, but that's completely okay. Your main focus is going to be to conquer all of Iberia, which you should be able to do within Sancho's lifetime. At the same time, when you get to Valencia, try to conquer Valencia quickly enough that you can get it before Rodrigo dies. In my particular run, Rodrigo did die early, and I had already reset three or four times because Rodrigo kept dying, and I decided that I was going to just say no to doing the Legacy of the Campeadors. So instead, I chose to keep the run going, and did a separate run later to get Legacy of the Campeadors. One thing to note as well is that as you conquer parts of the Muslim territory, we're going to be using this, the Iberian Struggle Casas Belli, and this one may give you some Muslim vassals, but because you're a Christian and you're righteous in your religion, you're allowed to revoke titles from Muslims for free. So as you're going, also take the time to get rid of any Muslim vassals because we don't want them there, because then they wouldn't be converting land to Christianity for us. As well, be converting land to Christianity as you go. We're going to convert to Catholic for now, but we're going to change to Mozarabism in a little while. You'll see. We're going to convert to Mozarabism once Iberia is actually fully conquered and once you've revoked all the titles from every Muslim in your land. We're doing that because Mozarabs are pluralist, so they don't get the right to revoke land without any tyranny from evil religions. But as a Catholic, you do get that. So you can revoke everything from Muslims, reassign it to Catholics, then convert. You should be able to accomplish all of this in Sancho's lifetime, but if you had trouble, then, you know, do it in a couple of characters if you need to, but just get it done as fast as you can. And then what you do once you become Mozarab is you just start converting everything. Eventually, we're going to take the decision to break with Rome, but we're going to do that a little bit later. At this particular section of the run, uh, the 13 hours of the stream were kind of weighing on me, and I decided to make a poor decision. I decided to end the struggle before converting all of Iberia to Mozarabism. This isn't a killer decision, it's not going to ruin your run, but it does make it a little bit less efficient. But just because we're already here in the run, let me explain to you how to end the struggle. Once you hit the compromise phase, immediately go ahead and grant independence to a bunch of counts. No dukes or kings, just counts and just release them everywhere. These, this is a good idea because you can re-vassalize them afterwards really, really easily because they're so weak and they're your religion and they're your culture. So release them all such that you have less than half of the Empire of Hispania in your kingdom, and then you can do status quo, and it's nice and easy. Once you do that, you'll be able to re-vassalize the vast majority of those vassals, especially if you choose to diverge your culture as an egalitarian culture and take a diplomatic court. You don't have to do that part of it, but that can really help if you're having trouble with it. 
The big reason why we don't want to do this right away and it's to wait till after Mozarabism has taken over Iberia is simply because if we do all those independence releases, then we end up probably dying of stress, which kind of sucks. Whereas if we'd been converting Iberia to Mozarabism, presumably Sancho would have died a natural death and we could have had a smoother succession. But either way, it still works out. Once Sancho dies, uh, we can start vassalizing everyone again that we previously released. They should mostly accept. The ones that won't, you can just go to war with them. And then we begin the conversions. We cannot do the next step till the conversions are done. So now it's a waiting game to convert everything. I recommend going down the theology perk tree so you can get a bunch of modifiers to your conversion speed, and then that'll make it go faster. Revassalizing everyone's gonna be pretty easy, and especially if you didn't release any dukes before ending the struggle, there will be no kings to worry about. Now obviously in my run again, sometimes you have to release a duke, it happens, so I did a couple dukes, so I got some kingdoms to take care of. But you, if you do this thing properly, won't have to worry about that problem. But even if you have to, again, it's completely fine. These are only optimizations, not requirements. While you're waiting to convert everything to Mozarabism, you can go ahead and break from Rome and then take the fundamentalist change to Mozarabism so that you can convert things faster. This again is not required, but it's a little bit faster to do that compared to staying pluralist. I recommend doing it, uh, but you don't necessarily have to, it just speeds things up a little bit. It'll also allow you to holy war against France later if you ever want to do that to expand some more. Once you break from Rome, you're going to be treating the Catholics as hostile, so you can use a whole orphan kingdom against them. Once you do that, for Aquitaine, you'll have everything that you need in terms of land. Now he's going to convert all of Iberia to Mozarabism, that will give you your achievements. Then you can convert to Islam, any kind. It's easy to get access to Muslim land as well, because it's already in Morocco, so you can get as much many discounts as you need to conversion. Then, when you're Muslim, you avenge Valve of Tours, this recreates the Empire of Hispania, you create the Empire, and then you're done the run. This run was the most heavy in terms of theory and mechanics that I've ever done in this entire playthrough series, so I'm really proud of it. And if it helped you, I really hope it did. I'm glad it did. But man, it was exhausting at 14 hours in. I was done by this time, but I still had another 16 hours to go, of course. Let's check out the next run, boys. It's a very similar one. This run's also a big one. We're going to be getting four achievements this run. The first two are Al Andalus, which requires you to start as an Iberian Muslim, control all of Iberia, and take the Avenge the Battle of Tours decision. Very similar to the last run, except this time we're actually getting the achievement for it. The second one is Iberian Conciliation, which requires you to end the Iberian struggle by setting your differences aside. This one is also going to be a little bit weird and manipulative how the status quo ending was, but it's got a few more things we have to do. The other two achievements in this run are Friendship is Magic, which requires you to use a friendship hook on a different faith ruler involved in the Iberian struggle, and History's Best Friends, which requires you to sleep with your best friend while having the ritualized friendship cultural tradition. All Iberian cultures have that tradition, so it'll work for us. The estimate for this run is about 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes, but the vast, vast, vast majority of this run is literally waiting, so it's pretty uninvolved. Regardless, let's get right into it, boys. For this run, we're also going to change one of the game rules, and that's the gender inclusion. So we're going to change to inverted, so that when we play as Andalusia, we'll inherit a bunch of our vassals' land and get their money and land for ourselves. We're also going to be using it to force the struggle to go into conciliation, which you'll see very soon how we do that. Beyond that, for character creation, we're going to make a martial-focused character with high martial stewardship and diplomacy. She's going to be about 45 years old, and we're going to give her four children. Two sons, two daughters. We'll be using these characters to make alliances later. And also, just in case you have a succession, although if you do this run right, you won't have to worry about succession at all. Give yourself temperate as well, so you live a little bit longer. It can be difficult to survive this entire run, because we're going to be hitting about 70 years of age, and that's pretty much the borderline for survivability reliably in this game, but temperate helps with that a lot. The moment we get into the game, you'll notice that you'll suddenly inherit a crap ton of land. And our first step is going to be to give all that land out to Andalusian nobles. So you gain 10 points towards conciliation for every local noble that you land, but the game is kind of weird in that it doesn't care if it's a local noble, it just cares that you click one of the two buttons where it generates a character. So you can give it all to Andalusians, you don't have to worry about giving it away to the proper culture, and by doing that, it will create more conciliation progress for you. This process takes a little while, by the way, so you're going to be clicking a lot of buttons and getting a lot of notifications on the right-hand side. Also, in the top of the screen, those little banners are going to keep stacking, because every time you grant a local noble a piece of land, you get 150 prestige as well. The prestige is nice, but isn't necessary for the run, but you're going to have to click through a lot of notifications. So have fun with that. This process takes a while, but it is important, so you do have to go through don't get lazy, give everything away, and keep all of the land in the Duchy of Cordoba and Duchy of Toledo. This is going to be your domain, just because we need it to actually win wars. The requirements for detente, which is conciliation basically, are pretty simple. You have to own less than half of Iberia, and then be allied to everyone who isn't you. 
So what our plan is going to be is to be conquering basically the vast majority of Iberia and then creating a vassal that we can grant a kingdom to which will thus make them independent who we're allied to from the get-go. So for example, let's say I have a duke in Aragon, I might grant him a bunch of vassals all across Iberia, and then I will give him a kingdom, like Valencia for example, and that makes him independent. Now I own less of Iberia, and since we're already allied because I gave him one of my daughters, or he gave me one of his sons, or whatever, then we're allied and good to go. Once we do that, we should be able to click the button, but the problem is going to be like giving away enough land, like giving away too much, and being able to conquer it back very easily. But that's why we took the diplomacy folks in the beginning. The plan is going to be to give away this stuff in Iberia, then to reconquer just enough of it that we can create the empire of Hispania, and then when we do that, we'll be able to just vassalize everyone using true ruler. In terms of getting uh, history's best friends, you basically can just pick any random male vassal of yours and then just sleep with them and by using romance. So the weird thing is that the soulmate relationship, for whatever reason, is considered also a best friend relationship. So if you ever romance any male ruler who's landed as a woman, you will get the achievement. So that one's really easy. In terms of friendship as magic, Asturias to your north is very easy to make friends with. So just use the befriend scheme. And then once that succeeds, go ahead and use the hook to, I don't know, arrange a marriage. Doesn't really matter what you use it for. Just do whatever you want. We have to ally Asturias eventually anyway for the sake of the achievement. It's easier to ally them than to conquer them. So you might as well use it to get an alliance with them. It's also important that you go on the Hajj to Mecca at some point and go on pilgrimages whenever you can because we're going to need piety to be able to declare a holy war for kingdom against West Francia for Aquitaine. We're doing that so we can get Al Andalus later. I recommend doing your holy war for Aquitaine before doing detente simply because it's easy and quick to do. So while you're waiting for the conciliation phase to come, which by this point it should be about three quarters of the way there, go ahead and attack West Francia. You should have the devotion for it, but if you're having trouble getting devotion, you can always build mosques, and those will give you extra devotion. So whatever you gotta do, you can make it happen. You're very rich with your current domain, so you shouldn't have to worry about money ever. And don't worry about conquering the guys to your north, because we'll just ally them. Once you're starting to get close to the conciliation phase, you can start kind of creating your big dukes that you know you're going to start granting kingdoms to. So in this case, I have a duke up here in Aragon that I've given Barcelona to, who I'm probably going to give the Kingdom of Valencia. But while he's still my vassal, I'm going to make an alliance with him through marriage. You can do it after making him independent, but the risk is that he might say no. So it's better to get it done now, while it's very easy, because vassals will always marry into the Lieges family. But once it's independent, you may not, so do it now. I'm going to make another vassal who I can grant a bunch of land to and make independent by giving them the Kingdom of Castile. In this case, I chose the Duchy of Navarra, and I'm going to grant all these little counts that are in the northern part of my kingdom away to this vassal, and when I give them Castile, all those vassals will go with them. So this way I can create another somewhat large independent kingdom that will then give me less of Iberia. Once the conciliation phase does actually arrive, it's time to give away these kingdoms and make our realm nice and small. Now, once we do that, these people are going to be, you know, pretty big. So because of that, conquering them is going to be pretty tough. But we still have an invade kingdom cost belly. In your case, you may have different particular borders than what I've got. So it's going to be up to you to decide kind of wh what exactly you should do. I'm going to use my invade kingdom on Valencia and take back all of that. You might have a better opportunity in your case. Regardless, our goal is to obtain the empire of Hispania. Once we do that, everyone will just take vassalization. It'll be very easy. In my case, I had to fight a few wars to get enough land to make Hispania. You may not have to, depending on how you organize things, so my run is not perfect, your run may be better. If you can stack enough vassalization modifiers, you may be able to even vassalize before making the Empire. And since Andalusian culture is courtly, you can go diplomatic court, which I really should have thought of, but it doesn't really matter. The run will get done regardless, and it still works out. The last vassal you're going to have to try to get once you make the Empire of Hispania is going to be the actual Queen of Asturias herself. Now, that's going to be a bit tough, but what you can do to circumvent the problem is simply convert to Catholicism. You should have a crap ton of piety from all the pilgrimages you've been doing to get piety to fight the King of France. So because of that, you can probably convert to Catholicism and then immediately convert back to Islam right afterwards. So go ahead and do that, and then you can hit the button to avenge the Battle of Tours, and the run is done. Congratulations. Let's have a look at the next one. We're almost at the end now, boys. Here's a nice quick one. We're going for two of the Northern Lords achievements. First up, we got Volva, which requires you to start as a North Germanic Asatruan and take the Found Witch Coven decision. Then there's Dangerous Business, which requires you as a Dwarf win a Ring Adventure anywhere outside of Europe. This achievement was patched in previous patches. It actually was win a Ring Adventure, period, doesn't matter where it was, but now it actually does have to be outside Europe. But this is still going to be a very quick and easy run, so let's get into it. For this run, we're of course going to create a custom ruler over in Kiev. It's going to be a Witch Dwarf. We're going to give him, like, 
pretty high in just about every stat except for Intrigue. We want to go about like 15-ish in Diplomacy, Martial, Stewardship, and Learning. This is just to make sure we cover all the bases. Then we give ourselves four suns, and then we're good to go. We can drop into the game. The moment you get in the game, you have two things to do. One is convert your children to witchcraft, and the second is get some raiding going. As you're raiding, you'll get some money and prestige. The prestige is important, but you can use the money to host feasts and to call hunts to get more prestige. Once we hit Distinguished Level of Fame, we can go on a Ring Adventure, so we'll do that very soon. Once you've got the required prestige for a Ring Adventure, we're not going to go on one right away. First, we're going to conquer a county from Abkhazia so we can get some range into Durbend, which is outside of Europe, and we can adventure there. As you've been doing all of your raiding and stuff, you should have been converting your children to witchcraft. By the time you get to Abkhazia, you'll probably have converted all of your kids, and then you'll be able to take the Found Witch Coven decision. Once you do that, you immediately get the achievement, and now what's left is dangerous business. Once you beat Abkhazia, you'll now have the diplomatic range to attack Durbent, and because we can go through rivers navigably, it's pretty easy to get to them. So go ahead and declare your ring adventure on Durbent. They're technically outside of Europe, just barely, and once you win that war, you'll be done the run, and then we can go on to the next one. So the next run is one of those ones that I have a little bit of personal trauma with. Uh, this is only because during the speedrun I do on stream, I do this like 15 hours into the run and it's like mind-numbingly boring. But you just doing it on your own, you're probably going to be completely fine. This one is Saga and Stone. It requires you to have your dynasty erect 100 rune stones. And normally this achievement is a complete pain in the ass. In this case though, it's only kind of a pain in the ass. You'll see what we do. So we're going to create a character for this that we're actually playing as. Go to the Byzantine Empire and create an Orthodox North Germanic character who can raise rune stones, of course. And we're going to be making him the most rich guy you'll ever meet. The only thing is, and I make this mistake every single run, I don't know how I forget every single time, do not make the character greedy, because the things we're going to do in this run, if you're greedy, you will simply give yourself a heart attack, and we do not want that to happen, of course. So, drop in as a high stewardship, avaricious character who is like about 50 years old, has one son, only one son, and nothing else, and who is not greedy, explicitly not greedy. I'm telling more myself than you guys, honestly. But right when you drop in the game, go ahead and put all your perks into the left-hand side of the stewardship tree. And now we're just going to build up 5,000 gold. Our first step for anything is to get to 5,000 gold because that is the exact amount of money that we will need to create 100 runestones. So, that's your first step. One thing to keep in mind is that the way CK3 is created right now in the current patches, no factions will rise up to dethrone you within the first about 10-ish years. Again, that time is variable. I'm not sure exactly how it works. I wish I was certain of it, but about 10 years, maybe 5 years, it just kind of is weird. So you're safe on the throne. You have that much time to get 5,000 gold. That's plenty of time, by the way. You'll make a lot of extra gold, to be honest with you. Once that time is up, though, there's going to be a faction to depose you and replace you with a Greek ruler. We're going to actually allow that faction to push their claim because we want to lose our throne. You'll see why very soon. So now we're just the Duke of Thrace, and this is actually perfect. We have exactly the lands that we need. You're going to lose Constantinople to the Emperor in a little while, because he'll claim it for himself, because he has that button he can take as Byzantine Emperor to always get Constantinople. You have one vassal in Calliopolis, and you have two counties. This is the explicit setup that we need. So, what you're going to do is, you're going to give away Burgess to your son, you're going to hold Bryces for yourself, and Calliopolis will be your vassal. Once you give away Burgess, you're going to try to arrest the guy in Calliopolis. He will say no, so then you get into a civil war. You surrender that civil war, and this will cause your Duchy of Thrace to pass on to your son, who's a Count. Now, what do you notice about that? Going from Count rank to Duke rank. That is one of the things you have to do to raise a runestone. So now, you're playing as your son, because you were deposed, and you've recently gained a rank, so you can put up a runestone. You can then do that again with your father, so give your father the county of Burgas, then try to arrest the guy in Calliopolis, you'll get into a war, surrender to the war, now you're playing as your father, repeat this 50 times, and then you get the achievement. I would make this run a little bit longer, like I'll explain more, but it literally is just this over and over again, and you will lose your mind just like I lost my mind. I highly recommend listening to Chung Eater by Triple Q. This song is absolutely amazing, and it will drive you even more insane, but it gives you that certain level of insanity power that you need to power through this kind of achievement run. So, you know, it's Chung Eater. It's good. Okay, I'll put a link to it. Once you've sufficiently sacrificed your mental health for this achievement run, you will get it, and then we can move on to the next one, boys. Let's go. For this one, we've got another very quick one from Northern Lords. It's called Far From Home. It requires you to start as a North Germanic Asatru and to have your capital on any Indian Ocean Island. This one's real fast, and it's another Haston run, which I absolutely love. Let's go. 
No character creation required for this one. We're going to drop in as Haston, and this is going to be a real quick, so we'll shoot through it. You're going to declare a county conquest for Napoli. I'm going to go and grab that. Once we have Napoli, we have the diplomatic range to attack Egypt, so we're going to adventure over to Egypt. I recommend the Duchy of Cairo, only because the capital is there, so when you siege it, you might capture the Sultan, and then you can win the war easily. Regardless, adventure to Cairo. It'll be an easy war. There is a chance that maybe, if you have like just really bad luck, he could beat you with his Mubarizan, because they're really overpowered. But if that happens, just restart, and then make sure to have better units next time. It probably won't happen, though. Once you're in Cairo, you can then declare a county conquest for a piece of Yemen. You'll see the one that I'm talking about in the video, I don't remember the name of it right now. And once you have that, you have diplomatic range to attack Socotra. Once you can attack Socotra, you adventure there, and then your capital will be on an Indian Ocean island. And that's the end of the run. Gosh, that was a quick one. That's like a world record for explaining the achievement, my goodness. Let's look at the next one, boys. Next up, we've got another royal court achievement. This one is called Beta Israel, and it requires you to, as a Jewish king in East Africa, diverge your culture. This one's pretty fast, but, you know, that's fine, isn't it? We're going to drop in as the king of Abyssinia, and there's no character creation, so just jump right in. We've got a couple of initial moves. We're going to take the theology focus for some extra piety. We're going to go on a pilgrimage to Alexandria. We're going to get a Jewish wife. And we're going to vassalize the county of Shoah, which is just to our south. These are our immediate opening moves. Then, we're going to focus on getting the vassal Demot. So it's a guy to our southwest. He's not part of our kingdom, but because we're the same religion and similar culture, we may be able to vassalize him. You can sway him while you're on your pilgrimage to try and help you out. And if you're really lucky, because our character has randomized stats, you may end up getting a diplomacy education focus. If you have that, then you can just go for true ruler immediately and be able to vassalize Demot basically instantly. But if you have to wait, you have to wait. It's no big deal. Just sway him and save some money for a gift if you need to. Once you can vassalize Demot, which you should be able to pretty quickly, take him into your kingdom and then grant him every title that you have except for the duchy that you have and give him vassalage of Shoah. Then, because he's outside of our kingdom, we can grant him independence. So give him independence immediately. And now we're a single county kingdom. And guess what? It's time to convert to Judaism. And then it's time to diverge the culture. You should have enough piety from your pilgrimage and from the theology focus to be able to become Jewish. Especially if you married a Jewish woman. And you should be able to diverge culture because you have only one county. So it costs only 500 prestige. Easy clap. That's the run. Let's move on to the next one. Alright, we're very close to the end now, boys. Here's another quick one to throw in. This one's called Seven Holy Cities. It requires you to, as a Hindu ruler, hold all seven Hindu holy sites at once, and let's just get right into it. We're going to drop in and make a custom character for the Pratihara Kingdom in North India. And basically, we're going to make a super diplomatic character whose culture is going to be Marathi, because they're Stoic. Stoic cultures get access to diplomatic courts, and we're of course going to be, you know, vassalizing everyone in India basically to pull off this run. It's a classic technique and it works pretty well. Your goal is uh, essentially vassalize the guy in South India who has the last holy set that you don't have, because as Pratihara, you already have six, there's only one more to get, and that's in South India. So go ahead and make an extremely high diplomacy character with basically some holy traits, doesn't really matter, and then drop into the game and we'll start vassalizing people. Once you've got True Ruler, which you'll be able to get basically right away because of your diplomacy focus, it's going to be pretty easy to vast everyone along the way to that one guy in South India. But the guys that are tribal in Central India are going to might be a little bit of a pain in the ass. But if you take Thoughtful, then you'll be able to send them gifts at double the opinion rate, and then they'll almost certainly get vassalized. So start the little cascade of vassalization. You have to wait a couple months for the army size modifier to change because it starts off being extremely awful. Then. You can just start your little wave of line down to South India. It's very easy to do. It's a very quick run. And once you get it, we'll move on to the next one. Next up is another very quick and easy one. This one's called Iberia or Iberia, which requires you to, as an Iberian ruler, control all of the Caucasian Iberia region. Now, the achievement says may not be available for characters made in the mood designer, but this is simply false. I don't know why Paradox always does this. They say you can't use character designed characters, but in reality you can. This run is made trivial by the fact that we can just make a custom character, so let's do that. For this run, we're actually going to be doing basically the exact same thing we just did in the previous run, where we're going to make an extremely diplomatic character with some virtuous traits, who's going to be of a foreign culture. So we're going to be Andalusian this time, because Andalusians are courtly, which means we can use the diplomatic court with this character. So our immediate move is, of course, to take all of our perks. We're going to go for True Ruler, and we're also going to get Thoughtful. In my case, in this run, I ended up getting a bunch of Intrigue perks for, like, no reason, because sometimes the game randomizes your perks. But it doesn't really matter. You can still do the run even if you don't get True Ruler. 
put up your court amenities to max level and then go ahead and vassalize everyone that you currently can who's in the eastern border. There are some Muslims over there in Iberia that you can't quite vassalize, so you have to war them, but they're really easy to go to war with, so who the hell cares? The big one is Georgia. If you have True Ruler, you can easily vassalize them the moment you send them a gift. In my case though, as extra challenge, I didn't have True Ruler, but I was still able to vassalize him anyway once I learned his language and got my court grandeur high enough. So once you vassal everyone and declare war on the Muslims and win, this run is done, it's really easy, and then that's it. Thanks Paradox for allowing custom characters even when you say you don't. Much appreciated. Let's move on to the very next one. So this run right here is going to be a backup in case you weren't able to get Legacy of the Campeadores, which requires you to create and roll Valencia as an heir to El Cid. In case you weren't able to get it before in the Jimenez run, we're going to get it now. It's a very quick run, and let's get right into it. For this run, there's no custom character to make. We're just going to drop in as Sancho, and basically we're going to play a regular Sancho game. We're going to conquer a bit of Valencia, just enough to make the kingdom. Then we just grant it to El Cid, and the run is done. The only thing to worry about in this run is if El Cid lives or not, but you can sort of counteract that by getting him married right at the beginning and hoping he has a son. If he has a son, then you can just give it to the son as well. It doesn't have to necessarily be him, it can just be one of his heirs. So yeah, like I said, basically playing a regular Sancho game, conquer all of your brother's kingdoms, conquer Navarra, go and head towards Valencia now. One thing I recommend is the Taifa of Toledo. I recommend getting that guy killed if you can. It's pretty easy to do because usually he has some vassals who don't like him. If he dies, he's much weaker and also might split his realm in half. From there, it's very easy. You're very powerful. You have El Cid, you have Sancho. They're both amazing commanders and you can easily decimate everyone in your path. You can also just ally yourself to France or ally yourself to someone else who can just give you a crap ton of troops to help you out. But either way, conquering Valencia is very easy and once you've taken six counties in Valencia, you can create the kingdom. Then you just grant it to El Cid. It's easy as that. Remember that this achievement does not require you to actually play as the character. You only have to give it to El Cid, then it counts. Once you give it to him, the run is done, you get the achievement, and that's it. GG, let's move on to the very last run of this achievement guide, which will be for end of an era. Ooh, exciting. Alright boys, we are finally coming to an end on this video guide about all the achievements in the game. Now, we're going for the big boy end of an era. Now obviously, we haven't gotten every achievement in the game yet, there's still lots to get. But End of an Era is a very, very, very long run, it's gonna be like 10 hours long. So that's gonna give us 10 hours to get everything else. That's gonna include stuff like Restore the Roman Empire, it's gonna include stuff like What Nepotism, it includes stuff like Perfect Circle, and a lot, a lot, a lot more, which I'll explain as we go. The very first one we're going to be getting, though, is Norman Yoke, which means we're going to be starting as William the Conqueror. I like to do that because, to me, playing in England is always really fun, because you get to be nice and isolated, you get a lot of domain that you can level up, and you have a lot of opportunity to gain a lot of power. So this is basically going to be a Normandy run. It's going to be a lot of fun. I personally enjoy this run, although, that being said, on my stream, this was at 16 hours of streaming at this point, so I was exhausted. Still fun, though. And it's going to take a long time, and we're going to get a lot of stuff done. This is going to be a very long section of the video. So, strap in. We're going for Norman Yoke first, and then a whole huge laundry list of everything that's left. So let's go for it, boys. For this run, we're not going to be making a custom character. We're going to drop in as William the Bastard over in Normandy. And it's going to be a pretty simple run right at the beginning, but this will, of course, expand to complexity later. For now, it's a simple win the war against England, and then we'll do some cool stuff with some tyranny afterwards. You'll see. Our immediate moves are going to be to get our kids married off so that we can get them alliances. So we're going to need some help against the King of England and against the King of Norway. We don't necessarily need it, but we want to keep our event spawn troops for as long as we can. So go ahead and get some alliances with guys like Bohemia, Denmark, Sweden, anyone like that, anyone that's any good, and then they can help you in this war as well as with the tyranny wars we're going to have later. Once you've got your allies to help you, let's make a landing, a little beachhead over in Kent, and we're going to occupy much stuff. Because we chose to wait, the English troops are going to be up in the north dealing with Norway, so they're not going to be here, which is actually accurate to the real history. So we're going to be able to occupy most of southern England before England can even come fight us. We do, however, want to see kind of if Norway's going to win or not. If Norway's going to win, then this war gets a little bit tougher, but if Norway is kind of at a white piece or they're not really quite willing to win the war right away, we want to win first so that we can beat Norway afterwards and then get money off them. In my run, Norway ended up losing the war before we could win against England, which is completely fine. It's not a big deal. It means you won't get some free cash. By the way, win the war against England. It's pretty easy and it should be simple because you'll get almost all your war score from the occupations you got while England was up in the north 
If you have to fight them once, then go for it. But if you don't have to even fight them at all, then that's a perfectly optimal run. Important note here is don't give away any of your domain, even though you're massively over the limit. First, we're going to revoke all the duchies away from all of our vassals. We want to basically North Korea strat temporarily and just take every piece of land away from every duke level Anglo-Saxon vassal. It's okay if you have count level vassals, but dukes have got to go. Now, luckily, we've got a crap ton of allies who can support us in these wars that otherwise we probably would lose. To try to imprison Mercia, we're going to hope that Northumbria joins the war against us so we can get both vassals in one war and then call in all of your allies to come help you. It's a defensive war, so it costs no prestige, and they'll come in and they'll basically win the war for you. Once you do win the war, we're gonna have to raise our crown authority so that we can revoke land from all of our vassals. Now, you probably have pretty low prestige from calling in these allies constantly, so it might be a little bit tough to actually pull this off, but you can get prestige by hosting some feasts, calling some hunts, maybe even getting remarried. You can always divorce your wife and get remarried for some prestige. It's up to you how you do it, but you have to increase your crown authority so you can revoke land. Once you are able to raise your crown authority, go ahead and revoke everything from those dukes up in the north. And once you do that, now you've got control of all of England at a duchy level. Remember that in the achievement requirements, you have to only have English vassals, but that means direct vassals. So it's okay to have little Anglo-Saxon counts here and there, but the problem is going to be if you have Anglo-Saxon dukes. So give away all the duchies you just revoked to Normans. For now, we're not English, but Normans will become English once we actually change cultures. So give away all your duchies to Normans, and now we can actually give out our land. We're going to hold on to Duchy of Kent and Duchy of Middlesex for ourselves. That's going to be our domain for the rest of the run, basically. You should also move your capital to London at this point and give away your Norman territory to a Norman vassal. This way you can keep your focus over in England. It also allows you to change cultures because in order to adopt English culture, you have to have your capital in England. Once you've given away all the land and given away the duchy titles, you should be able to click the Embrace English Culture button. And once you do that, every Norman vassal that's in the region of England becomes English, and then you will get the achievement. Easy clap. From here, we're going to run a pretty standard CK3 game, to be honest with you. There's not really much advice I have for you besides play the game as you would normally. We don't have any particular goal in mind, but we want to get a lot of power for ourselves. So use your marshal to increase control across all of your domain. Sit around building up some money-making buildings like manor houses and farmlands in your domain. And just, you know, manage your succession. So take a look at your children. Pick one of them that you really like get them married, then disinherit everyone else, or send them off to the monastery, whatever you are able to do. Remember that you can always imprison a kid and force them to become a monk, no matter what. So you may want to take on some tyranny and just imprison kids that you can't disinherit, and then make them go to the monastery. You can try to get them killed in battles, whatever you want to do. But basically, you're not really going to worry about too much at this point. You're going to mostly stay kind of just chilling. And once you build up a lot of money and a lot of strength, we may then consider expanding a bit outside of our borders. For the most part, we're going to be staying as something of a hermit kingdom on our British Isles here. But if a crusade happens, which happened to me here, then I recommend trying. Because if you can establish yourself with some fan members over in the Middle East, that'd be really good. The thing is, with the current patch of the game, crusades are extremely underpowered and it's very difficult to make a crusade work. So do your best, but don't depend on it. It's okay if you fail a crusade. Just give it a shot. Maybe evaluate if you can win or not. And if it's clearly a loss, go home, cut your losses. It's fine. If you think you can win, though, Try to get your family over in Jerusalem. That'd be pretty cool if you can do that. It's one more kingdom to add to our renown gain. Important note as well is that we're going for the achievement Hoarder. So to do that, we're going to need to make a crap ton of artifacts. So while you're building up your domain, focus first on getting your buildings done. But once you feel like you have a very healthy and sustainable economy, start building every single artifact that comes to your court. Because surprisingly enough, getting the correct number for the entire run is more of a challenge than you think. There's, I thought it would be easy, but actually I only barely scraped by getting it by the end of this run. So build every single artifact that you can. And in case you don't build enough, we have a way to get it done faster later on in the run that we'll only do if you need to. I'll explain it once we get there. Beyond that, our big goal as well is to build up a lot of piety. We're going to be changing religions later on to Paulicianism so that we can actually holy war around and get a lot of stuff done. We're also going to want to try to add by the sword as a cultural tradition to English culture whenever we can. Obviously, that's something you can do in your own pace. You're in no rush. But whenever you feel like you're ready to start expanding, then you should go. This is one of those runs where you can kind of go at the pace that you dictate for your own skill level. So if you think your economy is healthy and you think you can fend off your enemies, then convert. But don't rush it. Do it when you're genuinely ready. Because you're going to have a lot of extra time in this run. I believe I was done everything I had to do in this run by the time I still had like 100 years left. So you'll be okay. 
So once you build up enough strength and you feel comfortable going outside of your borders, take the bold step to become Paulician. We're choosing Paulician because it's fundamentalist, so when we holy war against other Christians, we'll take their land instead of vassalizing them. This is important so that we can maintain some homogeneity in our empire. Now, here's the problem. When you become Paulician, you might get crusaded because you're going to be controlling a holy site, which is in Canterbury. Now, there's kind of a couple different ways to sort of prevent this from happening. One, which I don't like, is you can give Kent to a Catholic person specifically so that Kent is still under Catholic control, which would mean the Pope won't target you. Or, you can just, whenever a crusade targets you, flip to Catholic really quickly, and then immediately redirect the crusade, and then go back to being Polish when the crusade's gone. That way, I think, works a little bit better, because I don't like to give up Kent, because Kent's one of my domain provinces. But it's up to you. Either one works. Once you do go Paulician, you can basically focus on conquering Scotland and Ireland, and then also I recommend using your Holy War for Kingdom CB against France, because when we take France, if we take the Kingdom of France while holding England, we actually get a new coat of arms for the title of England, and it looks pretty you know, nifty, so that's why I like doing that. But also because they're a big target nearby you that's very vulnerable, so it's a good option. Here I've got a demonstration for you what to do if a crusade happens. So here the Pope declares a crusade for England, and in response, I simply convert to Catholicism, and then the crusade goes to Jerusalem instead. In fact, I can even participate in this crusade because I can be a Catholic now properly, and maybe I can go win the crusade, maybe I will, maybe I won't. But once the crusade is over, I just switch back to Paulician, and it's as if nothing ever happened. I find this works pretty well. The only thing that can be scary about it is if you don't have enough piety to convert at the time. But because you're Paulician, Catholics are all over your realm, you probably will have enough piety. It should be a pretty cheap conversion in most cases. If not, you can try to go for a pilgrimage right away, or you can, you know, suffer the crusade you can you can probably win the crusade to be honest with you but it's you know why why do all that hassle when you can just convert for a second and convert back basically just keep conquering in all directions but important note is do not become an empire this is because we're going to do some crazy shenanigans with the holy roman empire and with the byzantine empire later so no no empires yet but eventually we will Alright, so we're going to do some empire dismantling, and this part of the run is always really, really fun because it's just it's just completely ridiculous what you can do in this game, and it makes me really happy, honestly. Alright, enough gushing, sorry. At some point with a character, go down the learning perk tree and grab the sanctioned loopholes perk. This allows you to buy a claim on any title that's above yours with piety. Now what this means is that if you're still a king, if you didn't make an empire, like I said, you can get a claim on the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire using just piety that you can then push to take over both empires. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm only getting a claim to the Holy Roman Empire, and I'm going to show you how to completely dismantle an empire from the inside. Your first step is to, of course, conquer the empire and become the emperor yourself. Now, because you've been building up your domain for all this time, and because you're quite strong as an English ruler, you should be able to defeat the Holy Roman Empire pretty easily, but if you can't, call in some allies if you need them. You should be of immense power though, because the Holy Roman Empire is always constantly fracturing, it's having trouble with building up a strong domain, the rulers are always pretty incompetent, whereas you have a really strong domain of Kent and Middlesex, and you're really good at the game because you're a pro gamer, and you can easily defeat them. Once you win the war against the Holy Roman Empire, we have a few things we're going to do to dismantle this empire from the top down, you'll see. We're not going to be able to maintain this empire, I'll just be honest with you. The number of random cultures that are not our own and the different religions are going to mean that we're going to very quickly lose this throne. But, while we're here, we're going to make every single kingdom that has not been made yet in all of our lands. The reason we're doing this is because when we inevitably lose the throne, we're then going to become a vassal of the Holy Roman Empire. But check this out, if we're a vassal of the Holy Roman Empire and we have all these kingdoms, we basically own the empire in all but name. So what we're going to do is, we're going to make all these kingdoms, and then we'll just get our independence and become once again an independent England, but we will have conquered the vast majority of the empire without ever gaining an empire title ourselves, allowing us to repeat this with the Byzantine Empire, and thus break their empire apart too. This technique I like to call empire dismantling. One thing to keep in mind is that you can maybe go too far and end up getting yourself ousted by your own vassals, but in theory, because of how strong you are, you should be able to keep your realm together. Even if a lot of vassals do break free, you've still dissolved the Holy Roman Empire, so your objective has been completed. You don't have to worry about it. In fact, I would even say it's completely fine to let a lot of vassals go, just so that you can have dismantled the Empire and then move on. Here you can see in my run, I just let him go, and it was no problem at all. I would recommend after this going after the Byzantine Empire, and do the exact same thing that you did to the Holy Roman Empire, 
but this time it'll probably be even easier because the Byzantines are going to be a little bit easier to manage and there's also fewer kingdoms to create. Again, when you do this, if you end up losing some vassals over in the Byzantine Empire, it's no problem, just let them go. You only want to dismantle the empire so they can stop growing and therefore not catch up to you because you're far ahead, but these empires can grow pretty strong, so kill them in the crib, if you will. If you can as well, and this is if you really want to troll the AI a little bit, go ahead and constantly change religions if you're able to get vassals to convert with you, just as a way to kind of permanently uproot this area. So for example, if I conquer the Byzantine Empire as a Catholic, like I did in this run, and then I convert to Paulicianism afterwards as a way to sort of get all those vassals to convert to Paulicianism with me, I may be able to get it work because my character is high in learning. The ability for vassals to convert with you is based on your learning relative to their learning and also their opinion of you. The opinion may be very low, but if your learning is extremely high, you probably can drag a lot of vassals with you into Paulicianism. And this you don't have to do, but the thing is, in a run like this, and this is an important lesson I would say for anyone doing a run like this, having fun is really important because you need to keep your patience. And if you're not having fun, you will lose patience. So have some fun with it. Do some creative stuff. You know, do whatever you want to do. You're too strong to fall at this point. You're, you're pretty much good. So do it anyway. Just do it for the fun. That's why I did it. Much like with the Holy Roman Empire, we're also going to be giving in to a faction demand eventually once it comes because we cannot possibly fight off all these vassals. So go ahead and let yourself lose the throne. Remember, you keep your claims afterwards so you can push them again later. But lose your throne, taking those kingdoms with you that you created, and now your realm has expanded once again. At this point, I would say if you wanted to start trying to actually own an empire for yourself, you could do it. Now that we've kind of dismantled the two major ones in the game. There are two major cultural traditions that are going to be the ones that actually matter for you. One is linguists. This is for piety generation because learning languages to get piety is a very effective way to keep your piety count high. You get a lot of piety per language. Number two is by the sword. Once we've dismantled all the empires, we're going to go wipe up what's left of the empires by declaring kingdom holy wars for them. When we do a kingdom holy war, we don't just take the title and take the vassals, we're going to be taking all those counties for ourselves, which we can then hand out to people of our culture and our religion. This will keep our realm stable, because as you saw before, when we take the HRE, or we take the Byzantine Empire in one move, we end up losing it right away because the vassals will overthrow us because we're a wrong culture, wrong religion. If we conquer them kingdom by kingdom using holy wars, we can appoint characters who will actually support us into those lands. So that's going to be our next move, is getting the right culture. In my run, by this point, I'm pretty sure I already had those traditions, but if you don't, then build up your prestige, which you should have a lot of from all these kingdoms you've been making, by the way. Build up your prestige so that you can get these traditions that will help you. Remember as well that the cooldown for reforming your culture can be circumvented by just diverging your culture. If your diplomacy is high enough, then everyone of your previous culture will probably just convert with you to your new culture, and you'll have 100% acceptance anyway. But every time you want to reform, if you're on cooldown and you have prestige and you want to reform, just diverge and then add the reform afterwards. Another tradition I recommend adding as well is religious blending, because as you've seen throughout this run, we've been constantly changing religions to suit what we're doing. So if you take religious blending, then there's no more negatives for opinion for wrong religion, which is really, really helpful since most of your vassals will be your religion anyway, and the ones that aren't, you're probably going to be getting rid of or trying to get to convert to your religion. So it works out pretty well to grab religious blending. Once you have the three traditions I recommended, that'd be linguists by the sword and religious blending, you now have what you need to keep your piety high, you have what you need to be able to use that piety to conquer more stuff, and you have a relatively stable realm, assuming you give land out to everyone of your own culture, which you should be doing by the way. This is good because we're going to have to get lingua franca at some point. Lingua franca requires the whole map to speak one language. That's pretty tough, but if you just conquer everything on the map, then everything will speak one language then, won't it? This is the point in the run where our runs are going to be vastly different from each other because this game is very, very, very wildly random, right? In my run, I actually almost gave up 21 hours in because I ended up losing a crap ton of land to just like a bunch of really bad successions and a bunch of really bad rebellions. And then the Mongols came in and started conquering stuff and it got really, really messy. But at the end of the day, because you maintain claims for two generations, you can pretty much always get back anything that you lose no matter how bad it gets. And in my case, I ended up getting everything back and making the run work. Basically, you follow the principle of religious blending by the sword and linguists. If you keep doing that and conquering things and then giving it out to people who will trust you and who will obey you, then you'll never have to worry about stability that much. In my case, I overextended, I was tired, playing for 20 hours, you know, it makes you very exhausted, and I ended up conquering too much at one time and ended up losing most of it. It almost made me lose the run, but thankfully I pulled it back at the end of the day. 
Basically from here, you're going to just sort of conquer the world. This is so that we can get Lingua Franca. Now, I have some tips for Lingua Franca that I'm going to discuss in a new section starting here. Lingua Franca is a tough one because there's no shortcut to it. This is one of those ones that you simply cannot do anything about besides doing the hard work. This achievement requires you to have all courts in the game speak your language. Now, the AI is reluctant to change languages. They very rarely do, here and there they do, but the only way to make sure that they will is to get rid of them. And that's the funny thing, is that you basically have to just conquer the world. Because the only way to guarantee that their court will speak your language is if they don't have a court. So we're going to just conquer the world, basically. But I have some ways to help you with it. You'll see. We can kind of stack the deck for ourselves here by actually creating vassal kingdoms that are our culture who will speak our language. Remember that the amount of court grandeur that you get for speaking a language is based on how many courts speak that language, whether or not they're of your religion, and whether or not they're in the same region as you. But we can sort of force other countries to want to adopt our language by spamming out kingdoms that speak our language that are underneath us. So whenever we conquer a new kingdom using By the Sword, we can create a vassal who owns that kingdom who is our culture who will speak our language. This will kind of propagate our language throughout more regions. This way you can maybe get some AI to convert. It's unreliable, and ultimately the true answer to this achievement is to just conquer everything, but it can be helpful. It can maybe get an AI here or there to convert, and in that way it's actually good. It also is good because you'll always be the most grandiose of all of the Anglic speaking kingdoms. So because of that, you'll get a lot of court grandeur bonus from all the other courts that speak Anglic with you being the top of them. Beyond that, I actually have no more advice. I mean, you basically have to just conquer every kingdom in the world and replace them with English speaking kingdoms. Sometimes you'll have vassals who may convert to local cultures or vassals who may make hybrids and then those hybrids speak a different language. If that happens, then you may have to revoke that kingdom off of that guy and replace them with someone who does speak your language again, or have to hope that they'll change back to your language. It kind of depends. Once you're in the sort of end phase of Lingua Franca, you're going to be sort of kingdom hunting for random courts that are there changing languages randomly. As you do that, just conquer them and replace them and over and over again, and eventually you'll get the achievement. It, it, you will, eventually. It seems hopeless but someday there will be no more kingdoms to worry about and you'll have it. This run effectively becomes a world conquest, although not quite. We don't quite conquer the whole world, but it will become one if it needs to be. The last piece of advice I have, I know I just I didn't have any more, but I got one more, and that's not for Lingua Franca, but it's for maintaining an empire. If your religion is something like I've chosen, I've gone with al Mohadism by this point in the run. Like I said, we're changing religions a lot, but that's why we took religious blending, right? You're going to have rebellions basically constantly from separatists who don't want to be under the al Mohadi rule, and you're going to have to take care of them, and it's going to look really scary because there's going to be like 100,000 or 300,000 peasants rising up. What you can do is, if you capture the leader of a peasant rebellion, then you win. Easy clap. So, I recommend what you do is don't try to fight all the peasant armies. You could fight them if you want to. Try to find the ruler, and then locate which army he's in, and then just fight that one army over and over again until you capture the leader. Hopefully you capture the leader, but if you don't, they'll eventually be transported to another army, fight that army, and just keep doing that until you win from capturing the leader. That should be the best way to do it. Sometimes you don't capture the leader and you do have to fight every single one of the armies, but remember, because peasant factions are composed only of levies and have no men in arms whatsoever, they're extremely weak, especially if you've been building up a lot of longbowmen and you have a lot of really powerful units, you'll be able to absolutely destroy them with even a fifth of their numbers. So you should be okay. Best of luck with that though, it can be intimidating sometimes. I've sort of skipped ahead pretty far in this run because as you go, you're going to get a few random achievements that you're just going to get naturally as you play. So first of all, you're going to get the Roman Empire just by virtue of conquering the whole thing. Convert to Christianity for like a second, create the Roman Empire, blah blah, you know, it's, it's easy. I don't have to explain to you to do that if you've been doing Lingua Franca, you're going to get Roman Empire. Other stuff like True Tolerance, you're going to get that by virtue of having so much land and giving away land only to your own culture because slowly you'll build up acceptance. You can speed it along by getting cult traditions like xenophilic or culture blending, whatever you want, but true tolerance will kind of just come over time. There's achievements like monumental. Again, that will just come from you building up a max level duchy building. You don't have to worry about that. It's something like seducer or seductive, I think it's called, my bad. Seductive is one that you have to sort of intentionally go and get, but I don't have to explain to you how to seduce 10 people. Just go seduce 10 people, it's very easy. There's not really a whole lot for me to explain on the miscellaneous ones, but there is one achievement that I'm going to explain to you in detail, purely because it does require some thinking, and that is Perfect Circle. So let's go talk about Perfect Circle. The Perfect Circle is essentially the famous inbreeding achievement, and there's two things we have to worry about with it. One is getting cucked, 
Two is not having enough time to get enough generations to pull it off. Berg Circle's description says to have only two distinct parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents. Now what this really means is that when you look at your character, they should basically have two parents, two grandparents, and two great-grandparents. Now I know that sounds really like obvious in your mind, but in when you actually look at it, it, it gets very confusing about how that actually works for the family tree. But I've realized that the best way to solve this is to not think about it too much. All you gotta do is for three generations, marry your siblings over and over again. That will result in what you're looking for. By the way, quick thing, the reason why I'm in the bottom right corner of the map this entire section is because I'm trying to make the game run faster. At this point, I'm 28 hours in and I'm almost done my speed run. So I'm trying to make the game run faster by being in the bottom right so the game is less to render. Okay, on to the actual run now. You want to play as women to avoid cuckoldry because ultimately, as a woman, you get to decide who sleeps with you. If anyone tries to seduce you, you just say no, and you can choose who to romance. So that's why we play as females for this entire thing as we try to get perfect circle. What you should do is marry someone at some point, marry anyone, and then have one son, one daughter, or some combination of many sons and many daughters, but at least one of each gender. Then force those two kids to get married to each other. This is your first generation of inbreeding. When you do that, those kids need to have a son and daughter themselves, those two kids to get married, then the next set of son and daughters to get married, and the kid that that third set has will create a perfect circle child. It can be a bit difficult to kind of pull this off because you worry about cuckoldry and all that, but if you have an, a religion like Adamite where it's equal succession, you can go to max level crown authority and then appoint a successor. You can always appoint a woman to be successor and therefore she'll always be the one to inherit. And if you're playing as a woman, you get to decide who is having sex with you. So it works out. When you are playing as the female character who is married to her brother, you're going to want to also take the seduction focus to increase your fertility because you're often going to have negative modifiers to that through inbreeding. And also incestuous characters tend to be less likely to want to have kids with each other, but you can circumvent that by romancing your brother. So go ahead and romance him and take him as a soulmate, and then you'll definitely have a kid, assuming neither of you are infertile. Besides that, there's not really much more I can offer you. Because I'm doing this at the end of the run, I'm basically ignoring everything that's going on in the world. I'm just focusing on this inbreeding stuff. But for you, you might want to be doing it a little bit more intentionally or maybe earlier in the game. I chose to do it last because I didn't want to have to mess around with succession like all that stuff. By the time I got to this point in the run, I was basically dominating the whole world and didn't have to worry about succession ever again, so I didn't care. Once you get to that third generation of sibling inbreeding, you'll be able to play as your either daughter or son or whatever it is who is going to be your perfect circle child. And this one gives you the achievement. At that point, you can stop the inbreeding if you're still playing the game and go back to regular breeding, although the effects may still be felt for generations to come. But in my case, I was at the end of my run, so I didn't really care. I just sort of let the game finish up. That's perfect circle. Best of luck with it, honestly. It can be a tough one, but if you, you know, make sure you're playing as women only, you don't have to worry about getting cucked. And if you make sure that you have elective succession or some kind of chosen succession, whatever you want to go with, then you can make sure you're playing the right characters. By the way, just just quick note here about Hoarder. If you didn't get it during this run because you weren't making every artifact that came your way, you can also make it by c capturing and abducting random people across the world who have inspirations and then forcing them to make artifacts for you. You should only do this if you really have to, but ultimately Hoarder is one that you should be getting by just every time you see an artifact, go make it. Even if it's terrible quality, just make every artifact that comes to your court. You should get it, nothing to worry about. And besides that, uh, we're done. I mean, that was the last big achievement. There's not really anything else to do now. You're, you're done the run at this point. There's little small achievements you can still be going for, but you're going to be getting them regardless of what you do. Stuff like a legacy to last the ages, a name known throughout the world, uh, the, all that kind of thing. You're going to get those no matter what you're doing. So I'm going to call this the end of the all achievements guide. You should have everything at this point. If there's anything that you're missing, okay, then look at it and just think, okay, how do I get this? For example, you may not have gotten first of the Crusader Kings during your Wily as the Fox run like I did, but if that's the case, all you have to do is go jump in as the King of Denmark or whatever in 1066 and wait like 10 years, and then you'll be able to join the first Crusade. Easy, not, not nothing to worry about there. Did you see what I mean? Like these ones are just so easy, I don't have to make a guide for them, so you're pretty much done. I will, however, show you the last couple achievements I had to get in my runs that I ended up missing. I ended up missing Paragon of Virtue and uh, Bask in My Glory. Both of them are so easy to get that I didn't even bother explaining them, but I'll show them to you on camera here. Let's also not forget, of course, End of an Era, which you'll get at 1453 as scheduled. Easy clap, I don't have to explain that one. Just finish the game, forehead. We're gonna quickly blaze through these. So we've got Bask in My Glory, which requires you to reform the Era Zaharuk faith. And this is really, really easy to do just as El Andalus, to be honest with you. 
you can go in as al Andalus and give yourself some of the, at least one sinful trait in Islam so that you can make the Era Zaharak faith. I chose to also make yourself a giant because they're holy in Era Zaharak. Honestly, I was so tired at this point that I was making all kinds of mistakes. I actually messed up this run like three times somehow, even though it's so easy. But basically, you just go in as al Andalus and you conquer enough pieces of old Vasconia that you can make the religion. And it's literally as easy as that. Go to Mecca, go on a pilgrimage, whatever you have to do to get the piety for it, and then you're good to go. This one is so quick and easy. I'm not even going to bother really explaining it. It takes a second. You can make a custom character for it. It's so easy to do. You got this, okay? The second one is Paragon of Virtue. So this one, you just make a custom character who has three traits that are holy in another religion. So in my case, I chose to go to East Anglia and make a Norse character there as a custom character who had three holy traits in Catholicism. The moment I got in the game, I went on a pilgrimage, got the piety that I needed, and then went and changed religion to Catholicism. Boom, now I'm a Paragon of Virtue. That's it. That's the end of the run. And that will get you every achievement in the game. Boom. And no one canceled it, so... Um, sick. We got it. There it is. Okay, 29 hours and 26 minutes and 35 seconds. And that was kind of weird at the end, but look, we got it. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't even know what to uh, what to say right now. Honestly, I'm just, I'm just happy we finally fucking got it. Um, there it is. 30, 30 hour stream and 42 minutes. 30, 30 hours and 42 minutes stream. Okay. Every achievement in the game. Uh, including Fate of Iberia, finally done, sub-30, barely, okay, just barely sub-30, and uh, I think, yeah, hi, hi, say hi to YouTube, guys, say hi, to, say hi to everything. So that's it, guys, that is the CK3 All Achievements Guide, Speedrun Guide, Insane Man Does Crazy Stupid Thing and Spends 30 Hours Streaming to Get Every Achievement in the Game in One Sitting. This is definitely the most insane thing I've done on stream and on YouTube and everything. I'm very proud of it. I hope that you can get some value from it. I hope you enjoyed it. But my god, um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it again, to be honest. Because obviously when the next DLC comes out, there's going to be another set of achievements. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. I told my stream that I wouldn't do it. I don't know. I'm, I'm a pretty crazy guy, so maybe I'll consider doing it, end up doing it at the end of the day. I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to be honest. I barely made it in that 30-hour stream. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you want more content like this, consider subscribing and liking. I do video essays and I do guides, so that's kind of my thing. Uh, when I do guides, I go all out, as you can see from this three hour, almost three hours, two and a half hour, whatever. I don't know how long it's going to be when it's done. Uh, this very long video about CK3. Okay. I would really appreciate it if you went and followed me on Twitch as well. That's where the vast majority of my content is, is streaming. I'm trying to do more YouTube stuff, but YouTube stuff does require a lot of work out of me. So if you want to see me more, you'll find me on Twitch. If you want to see more edited content in the same style you're seeing now, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Regardless, I hope you have a wonderful day, night, evening, afternoon, whatever time of day it is for you. It was a pleasure having you here. Leave a comment on your opinion of what strategies you think work and what strategies you don't think work. If you have any ideas yourself, I'm happy to hear them. And uh, yeah, you can expect more videos soon. I'm going to make a sort of video essay about CK3 in a little while. I'm taking a bit of time off after this video, but you're going to expect another video essay about CK3 soon. And then from there, I'm going to branch into some other content besides just CK3. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I hope you guys had a good time. I'll see you on Twitch, perhaps. Maybe I won't. Up to you, I suppose. And yeah. Until next time, boys. Until next time. Peace out.